Hello everybody and welcome to Midwinter Keats, uh, a seminar organised by the Keats Foundation in collaboration with the School of English at St Andrews University. Uh, this three hour seminar is going to have six speakers and I'll be introducing our first speaker in a moment and it's intended as a kind of trailer or reminder about the annual Keats Conference that is put on by the Keats Foundation and which will be returning after three years between the 20th and the 22nd of May this year. So put those dates in your diary and watch out for the publicity for the conference on the Keats Foundation website. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, an old friend, uh, a distinguished Keatsian and a wonderful close reader of romantic poetry, Susan Wolfson, who is of course, Professor of English Literature at Princeton University. Susan has written about all the major romantic writers uh, and she has a, a long and distinguished record of writing about John Keats in particular. I think her first writing about Keats uh, was back in 1982 and she followed this with her first major book, The Questioning Presence, Wordsworth Keats and the Interrogative Mode in Romantic Poetry. She has followed this with a whole series of books uh, about Keats uh, and containing Keats's texts. Uh, the Cambridge Companion to Keats, uh, the Longman Cultural Edition of Keats's Poems and Letters. Uh, in 2015, I think I'm right in saying, Reading John Keats was published by Cambridge University Press, a book which shows us how Susan works as a close reader of complex forms and languages. Most recently, Susan has published uh, On He Flared, Essays on Four Letters of John Keats. Just appeared a few months ago. Um, it's a, a, a development from uh, the excellent Keats Letters Project, which you'll all be aware of. Uh, and in it, Susan uh, explores four letters of Keats. Um, and this is published by uh, the Keats Shelley House uh, at Rome. Uh, and the, pr the proceeds from this book uh, will go to support the Keats Shelley Memorial Association's activities at the Keats Shelley House. It's a wonderful idea and a beautifully produced book, as you can see. It's a great pleasure to ask Susan to speak to us now by way of setting our program going uh, this afternoon. And she's going to take as her subject one of the letters from this book, On He Flared, Essays on Four Letters of John Keats. Here's Susan Wolfson. Well, thank you, Nick, for this invitation and uh, that lovely introduction. And thank you to everyone for coming today. Um, I'm delighted to talk about my book, On He Flares, which, as Nick mentioned, presents four immersive essays about four of Keats's letters, one of which embeds an early sonnet, and their context of writing, along with one poem by me, embedding a passage in a letter by Keats. Letters of poets are often treated as supplementary resources for reading the quote, creative work. Keats's letters are this for sure, but also otherwise. This is such a sociable archive, as brilliant and lively as the poetry. No surprise then that striking passages in Keats's letters have a poetic pulse. And no surprise too, that some of his poetry was first drafted in or into his letters, even as letters. So here's a thought experiment, the sort of thing that Keats liked to entertain in his letters. He says, suppose a rose to have sensation, or may there not be superior beings amused with any graceful though instinctive attitude my mind may fall into as I am entertained with the alertness of a stoat or the anxiety of a deer. Well, let us suppose that Keats's fame was primarily as a letter writer of extraordinarily compelling interest in power, which he is, who also just happened to write poetry. Well, that's just a speculation in both the cognitive sense of speculating and the investment sense, but it is what inspired the unparalleled Keats Letters Project corresponding with Keats. 
this initiative and the on, online site is being beautifully managed by Brian Rejack, took up a bicentenary project of publishing essays, variously meditative, interpretive, playful, informative, on the 200th anniversary of every one of Keats's letters, typically embellished on the site with autograph images, pictures of people and places, relevant artwork. Brian tells me there are still openings for contributions, so do contact him um, if you are inspired. When I was asked to contribute, <coughs> my first impulse, understandably, was to bid for the famous um, most anthologized gems, the ones we all know, the letters that hold such memorable epiphanies as negative capability, the intensity of working out conceits, the veil of soul making as a metaphor for life, the ardor of pursuit as a metaphor for reading, a greeting of the spirit as a metaphor for reading, the chameleon poet and the poet of the Wordsworthian or egotistical sublime, as two characters, the chamber of maiden thought and dark passages as a metaphor for thinking, the surprise of fine, of by a fine excess about what poetry does, and of course, repetition in a finer tone. To write about Keats's letters was dreamland for me in both senses. First, in my dreams, of course, the founders of the project had first dibs on the gems. But such preemption proves something of a sparkling Felix culpa for me, because I wound up with surprisingly unanticipated landings that gave me new dreams. An adventure into details, inflections, and nuances that I had previously skimmed over. Hauntingly adhesive involvements, lively affections, and the durable intimacies of, of close reading, word by word, line by line, ranging from Keats's early correspondence with the passionate painter, Benjamin Robert Hayden in November, 1816. His letters to him are only the 12th and 13th in Hyder Rollins' still standard edition. Um, it's a back and forth about that early fired up sonnet, great spirits now on earth are sojourning. Then to a mid-career letter that pauses for bemused, tender affection for some household cats. To a carefully measured soul correspondence with Percy Bysshe Shelley in the summer of 1820, during which Keats insisted on the charge of poetry to load every rift with ore. To the accidental timeliness for us of a quarantine letter in October 1820, to the mother of his beloved Fanny Braun, reporting the alternate agonies and amusements of a long arrest in Naples Harbor. And then with many other contributors to the letters project, all of us taking up some facet of Keats's last known letter, I did a bit um, on Keats's letter to Charles Brown from Rome, 30 November, 1820. On he flared. These are the final words that Keats wrote in his poet autobiography, The Fall of Hyperion, breaking off at the fierce energy of a god who having seen his brother gods, once immortal, fall into mortal sadness and death, knows his own doom, feels it fiercely on his pulses, yet responds not with sad surrender, but with vivid full throttle passion. Keats nursed his brother Tom as he was dying. His brother George left for America, existentially in some ways dead to him. Uh, he knew what it meant. Keats's letters from beginning to end um, vividly give us a sense not only of the craftsman, but the man embracing life's energies with death a too near horizon. On he flared and still does. I thought that a timely excerpt from my little book could be drawn from its chapter on Keats's quarantine letter, and I'll end with my poem on Keats's cats. First, the letter, written from Naples Harbor, 24 October, 1820. My chapter title is a phrase from this letter, a spirit in my brain, an intellect in splints. 
Keats's posthumous existence, as he phrased it to Charles Brown, was upon him already, but he refused extinguishing. This was not, this splintering was not the first thing, in fact, Keats wrote to Mrs. Braun, Fanny's mother, about his state on the fourth day of a 10 days quarantine. He wants to assure her of his energy. Uh, the arrest was due to reports of an outbreak of typhus in London. It had the Italian authorities keeping everything English offshore for six weeks, of which their brig had already logged in five at sea. Keats did not set foot on Italy's ground until 31 October, his 25th birthday, and the day before the 20th anniversary of his beloved Fanny Broad's christening. Um, this was a kind of signal day for him. Naples Harbor was his sixth home since early May. A rapid compression of a life's pacing that ever since the death of his father when he was a boy had made every home thereafter a fragile stability, ever temporary. His most recent and really quite happy home on land was with the bronze. The next was that brig, the Maria Crowther, Mariah Crowther, I guess you say, a small two-masted coastal trade ship fitted out to host a few passengers for a 2,600 mile trip to Naples. Naples, too allegorically from the pun-ready Gravesend to this new city. The cramped quarters for six hosted the captain and his cat, his mate, Keats, and his friend and companion, Joseph Severn, a consumptive Miss Cotterell, age 18, who was going to Naples to stay with her brother, and a robust middle-aged Mrs. Pigeon, her cranky paid companion. Miss Cotterell was not only a sad sight in herself, but a horrible mirror of Keats in female form and a revenant of poor Tom. Here, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, the voyage that commenced from Gravesend on 17 September was no breeze. It was delayed for weeks at the start amid gales and mountainous waves, their room flooded, nearly shipwrecking storms, then along the Iberian coast, military turmoils and interventions. Keats suffered several collapses, even as he tried to keep his spirits up. His only solace was having spared Mrs. Braun and Fanny from having to see him this way. He really wanted to write to Fanny in the best spirits he could command, but he couldn't trust his composure if he addressed her directly. So he writes to her mother with true affection and disciplined deflection. His still living hand could not manage the pen with his usual steadiness as the manuscript shows, though he did his best to be brief and newsy. He begins by promising just a few words about what sort of passage we had and the present quarantine. Once he started writing, however, a few words became a story of about 600 words, filling up four pages about the sea air, the harbor sites and new marvels, about his health and disposition with frequent call outs to Fanny and it ends with affectionate remembrances for a whole community back in England. The quarantine was no complete hell on water. While it was still a prison shut up in a tier of ships is how Keats phrased it, their only relief from, from the hot weather, harbor breezes and cooling nights, it was also a sight and scene of new marvels, not least the dazzling Italian light, the lucid dawns, the vivid sunsets. The deep blue water bustled with merchant crafts and white sailed vessels. Boats of singers came to greet them. Vistas of white houses rose along terraced Naples, interspersed with vineyards and olive orchards, Vesuvius beyond topped in purplish smoke. A few weeks of ever more meager rations, uh, um, after a few weeks of their ever more re, uh, meager rations came a wash of wine, flowers, and baskets of fresh fruit, um, vegetables, melons, peaches, figs, grapes, along with silverfish. These provisions either purchased or generously given to them. 
every day brought some novelty. True to its name, Naples was a new world. Just after asking Mrs. Braun for the first time, give my love to Fanny, Keats writes himself into a fantasy inspiration and tell her if I were well, there is enough in this port of Naples to fill a choir of paper. It looks like a dream. It has this surreality because Keats senses his fading. Every man who can row his boat and walk and talk seems a different being from myself. I do not feel in the world. The too real thing is the oversharing Miss Cotterell, that young lady in the consumption. Her bad symptoms, Keats writes, preyed upon me with the knowledge of her complaint, the flushings in her face. This is chameleon poetics with a vengeance. Keats was determined not to whine to Mrs. Braun, so plays himself theatrically. I would always wish you to think of me a little worse than I really am. And not being of a sanguine disposition, I am likely to succeed. If I do not recover, your regret will be softened. If I do, your pleasure will be doubled. This last sentence is a run-on syntax and is poignant as if the second thought, if I do, your pleasure will be doubled, barely deserves independent considering and a likely impossibility. Mrs. Braun knew how to read between the jesting lines and Keats knows this. His next interlinear, interlinear move gravitates to Fanny. I dare not fix my mind on Fanny. I have not dared to think of her. Of course he is thinking of her, he clearly is. And he's doing so by proxy fixations as well. Thinking for hours together of having the knife she gave me put in a silver case, the hair in a locket and the pocketbook in a gold net. Um, the knife is, is a pen knife. Um, though these were meant for use, um, they weren't being used. Um, they were there to fetishize as tokens of the giver. To say he's been thinking for hours together is not just clock time, but magnetic psychic time. As if Fanny, hearing of his treasuring, might feel it herself too. Show her this, Keats writes just after. Bodily plight and new delights had Keats wavering between two sensations of self, one under the shadow of mortality, another of the world of Italy all before him. Oh, what an account I could give of the Bay of Naples if I could once more feel myself a citizen of this world I feel a spirit in my brain would lay it forth pleasantly. Oh, what a misery it is to have an intellect in splints. Between the two sides of O oh is a soft rotation of this world away from the well-known and resonant phrase, citizen of the world. He knew, Mrs. Braun knew that he knew that his letter would be read by Fanny and he didn't want quite yet to write his obituary. So I'm about as I was, give my love to Fanny, he had written on the first page. And then again, right after talking about his intellect and splints, my love again to Fanny, as if repetition might conjure her, might let him imagine her reading him while he is still alive and alive to her. Breaking a skid into pathos, Keats turns to the rest of the family. Tell Toots I wish I could picture a basket of grapes and tell Sam the fellow's catch here with a little line, a little fish much like an anchovy. This is a brotherly wink as if he and Sam might try this together sometime. And Keats loved those grapes, a joy in the last days of quarantine supplied by Miss Cotterell's brother who seemed to have a porphyro skill in coming up with quote, all manner of dainties and luxuries. Keats closes with a sociable greeting to their friends, the Dilks, and then one more run at a delinquent friend, Charles Brown, whom he had hoped would come with him to Italy. Mention to Brown that I wrote him a letter at Portmouth, that's how he spells it, which I did not send and am in doubt if he ever will see it. The letter unsent is a pained proxy for Brown's not seeing Keats 
for Keats not seeing Brown. And then by association, everyone Keats knew he would never see again, Fanny most of all. He signs off, my dear Mrs. Braun, yours sincerely and affectionate, John Keats. Then he breaks decorum to write in the space still available at the bottom of the page. Goodbye, Fanny, God bless you. These are the last words he'll ever write to her. A double goodbye, first in the idiom, then in the original sense, a heartfelt sense, God bless you, from a theological skeptic. I shall feel the load off me when the lady vanishes, he said to Mrs. Braun of Miss Cotterell. The lady vanishes is a virtual Keats meme, from Endymion to La Belle Dame Sans Merci, to Lamia, and finally to Fanny Braun. I eternally see her figure eternally vanishing, he wrote to Brown, even at the thought of leaving her in that shipboard letter of 30 September. Fanny fading from person to figure, from figure to a phantom in the fane of the mind, has Keats repeating eternally in doubled syntax, his eternally seeing her and her eternally vanishing from him, an Orphic torture that renders a horrible parody of a lover winning near the goal. It is traditionally the one who is leaving who says goodbye, the one staying says farewell. With Fanny, goodbye, he's leaving her, is also implicitly her goodbye to him, her vanishing. He wrote only two letters after his release from quarantine, both again to Brown, one from Naples the day after they disembarked, and one from Rome, 30 November, the last letter he would or could write. For all this, the social courage that Keats kept up during the passage and kept up during quarantine continued to animate his life in words. At my worst in quarantine, I summoned up more puns in a sort of desperation in one week than in any year of my life, he remarks to Brown in that last letter to him, the one in which he had confessed just words before, I have an habitual feeling of my real life having passed and that I am leading a posthumous existence. Weekly, maybe even unconsciously, punning the word he spells P-A-S-T into P-A-S-S-E-D. If his body was concentrating into a past, Keats's present tense, I am, still has him tuned habitually to anatomies of language, playing its sounds and signs in the chances of creative fun. Keats's letters are full of the materiality of this insistent verbal life in which he has somehow managed to be a citizen of so many worlds with a management of um, information, impression, expression, um, drawing heartbreak into the continuing pulse of a still living hand. Um, and now the poem, mine with an excerpt from the living hand of Keats's letter to his family, 3 January, 1819. I titled it Keats's Cats. My Italian partners um, subtitled it or parallel titled it um, Gatti de Keats. Um, his hand is still on their paws uh, for starters. Here's the poem. The cat is not an old maid herself. Her daughter is proof of it. I have questioned her. I have looked at the lines of her paw. I have felt her pulse to no purpose. Why should the old cat come to me? I ask myself, and myself has not a word to answer. It may come to light someday. The old cats who live in the Protestant cemetery in Rome, faithfully, quietly to Keats's grave have come to alight among the violets, sitting as if statues of themselves with not a word to answer. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. That was marvellous. Um, the way in which you move from uh, the context uh, of Keats's life uh, in that autumn of 1820 uh, to read with such sensitivity and insight into the heart of his letter to Mrs. Braun 
uh, has been wonderfully moving and uh, we've we've all been uh, privileged to hear this i particularly like um the way in which you create the contexts and then move on to explore what you call the disciplined deflections of the rhetoric and the language of Keats's uh, letter to Mrs. Braun. Uh, it's been a wonderful paper to set Midwinter Keats going, and I'm sure there are going to be many questions to follow. So, um, any questions for Susan? I have a question, but it's really uh, open to you if you have a question. I, or just conversation. Um, you or know, just you conversation. Have to, um, said a question by way, though, as Keith said, a question is the best. Uh, can do a little speculation. Um, well, can I can I take you back to uh, just before um, uh, the year before Keats um, uh, left uh, Hampstead for uh, Naples? Uh, I've been interested in when Keats um, had his first hemorrhage, as we're in the territory of consumption uh, in, in this letter. Um, the the, the, um, the official account, as it were, is something like the 3rd of February, but Fanny Braun and Charles Brown were convinced that he'd been taken ill earlier and I wonder, uh, in January. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I know it's not strictly speaking on the letter you've been talking about, but it, it, it is related in the sense that the two correspondents uh, are, are there. Well, I think just that sense, first of all, that, that traumatic event, whether it was January or early February, Keith said, that's my death warrant. I mean, he understood that he had no time or that time was rapidly running out. Um, but, you know, as all his biographers note, I mean, he picked up this sore throat um, on the Scottish uh, summer with, with uh, Brown, which cut short his honeymoon with Brown. I mean, he'd been really looking forward to that. Um, and, you know, and sent him back to London. And he was never really able to shake that. Um, I mean, you know, whatever optimism he had and engine to keep going as a poet, um, he was enough of his, a brilliant medical student um, to understand the symptomology. He had seen his mother die of this disease. He'd seen intimately seen his brother die of this disease. Um, and um, it, you know, it was felt to be a kind of genetic curse. This, the, um, the, uh, the medical understanding of consumption uh, of tuberculosis as a, a contagion that got transmitted mm -hmm. um, bacterially uh, was not understood for decades. Um, so there was a sense almost of this you know, as, as a, a, a genetic curse, which was manifesting itself. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, you know, traumatically, catastrophically, um, you know, at, at the beginning of, of that year. Um, and but, you know, you, to read Keats's writing across 1819 is to really register that shadow of mortality on every moment of joy. I mean, this is the dynamics of melancholy, right, that that melancholy is the master trope for that package. Um, that everything valuable is valuable because of its interplay with um, its antithesis. Uh, thanks very much, Susan. We, we've got some questions coming in. Katie Garner has a question uh, about cats. Are there other references to cats elsewhere in the letters or in the poems? Um, so that, that's just relaying what Katie has written on the uh, chat column. Um, hi, Katie. Um, well, you know, Keats and cats is, is a big subject and not just because of, of the mere lettering. Um, he's, you know, Keats is a bit of a hero in the, in, the, uh, in the cat world for his sonnet to Mrs. Reynolds' cat, cat which is, you know, again, it's an old cat. Um, and it's a kind of, um, you know, Homeric address inside the space of a sonnet. This cat has seen lots of battles and um, bears the marks of battles on its velvet ears. And Keats is interviewing the, the cat. You know, it's almost like Wordsworth sidling up to the discharged veteran and trying to get a heroic epic out of him. And, you know, he, he doesn't have anything to say. And this cat is um, a kind of little feline version of that. Keats wants an interview with this cat about all the battles. And the cat is just not 
putting out. And, you know, so it's sort of Keats's first um, adventure, I think, into the um, poetics of something uh, that is not responding to answers and is an interesting object of imagination in that aspect. Um, I don't have it fresh in mind, but I could I could pull it up. But um, yeah, it's um, it's a very amusing little poem. So that's the other cat I know. Um, I'm trying to think other than the household cats. Um, Nick, can you think of, are there other cats in Keats? I mean, the, the sonnet is just such a spectacular um, moment that it's, you know, it's, it's sufficient in itself. Oh, well, obviously there's the captain's cat on the ship. You know, and Keats is always amused by cats. You, you, you evoked the, um, the, the journey to, to Naples uh, very clearly with your, your description of the Maria Crowther and the little cabin that uh, Keats and Seven were sharing with Miss Cotterell and um, Mrs. Pigeon, I think. Yes, I mean, they um, seem like characters out of, of you know, a, a restoration farce or something, yeah. The, the, it's curious, isn't it, that um, the, in what one would imagine was a, 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 a dreadful, uh, cramped uh, quarter uh, for four or five people to be sharing that seven got through it all without becoming ill. Yeah. Um, uh, strange, isn't it? I, I think well, that... the bronze did too. I mean, they were nursing Keats for a month. Hmm. Um, you know, when he when he had, you know, just exploded and left um, the hunts, the hunts, you know, over busy household and staggered along Hampstead Heath to the Bentley's boarding house, which was um, boarded up for the night and somehow got himself to the bronze and Mrs. Braun took him in, but none of the bronze um, got, got sick either. So, uh, you know, I don't quite understand, I mean, I don't have the medical understanding of, you know, of, of contagion and how that worked. Um, we're, st we're still with cats on the questions. Um, Richard, oh, no, um, Richard points out that Jane Campion said she chose Ben Wishaw to play Keats in her film because he looked like a cat. Uh, and we have uh, um, some other comments here about uh, a likeness to leopards in Lamia. Um, uh, and um, there is the, um, the, the, the Charmian uh, woman that Keats met, uh, who he liked yeah. to a leopardess, so that we can... Yeah. Well, leopards are a different order of cat. They're not house <laughs> cats, you know, so they're, they're in the Keatsian um, exotic imaginary. I don't even know if he ever saw a leopard, um, you know, an actual leopard in his life. Um, but yeah, there's, um, you know, th that's a whole different sort of, you know, the Keatsian bestiary. But it's the um, it's the intimate relationship with household cats that um, focuses that that sonnet and I think you know Keats's um, affection, um, you know chameleon affection for um, what these animals know and aren't saying. Mm. I think the Keats brothers kept a dog uh, in the days when he was a medical student. There's a reference to mm -hmm. at least I assume it's a dog. Um, uh, 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 there's a reference in one of the letters to Wagtail. Uh, and I think Wagtail might have been a dog of some kind that, that they were keeping, but it's yeah. just one. So, um, uh, unless it's a sarcastic comment about a sycophantic medical student. Um, could but... be. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Eldred Harrington. Oh, um, Ellie, hi. Can Go you on. comment further on the ways in which Keats writes his correspondence imagined voices into his letters, the sense that he might be um, ventriloquizing Fanny, Fanny Braun's voice and doubling it with his own. So correspondence imagined voices in his letters. Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, because as we know, I mean, Keith often um, in his letters re reports conversations and parodies the way people talk, um, Dilk especially. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a way in which um, that you can see in his interest in just staging conversations and soliciting voices and um, um, doing a kind of mimesis of, of people's voices that if Keats, this is always the parlor game, if Keats had had, you know, the years that Carlyle had, Carlyle was born the same year, he might have become a Victorian novelist or a novelist of social manners. Um, his, his letters, you know, his letters certainly have that kind of um, imagination pulsing through them. 
Uh, the question of Fanny is much more particular and poignant. I mean, Keats knows that Fanny either is reading this letter with her mother or will read it immediately after. So in effect, he is writing to her and conjuring her, um, you know, as, as he's writing, he's conjuring her um, as, as the reader. And that is, um, that is partly the muse of this letter. I mean, he, he adores Mrs. Braun, but he loves Fanny. And it's bringing Fanny to his mind um, with pain solace, or maybe not even solace, just pain, um, that is inevitably part of part of this occasion. Mm -hmm. He says at one point, you know, I can bear, I I can't see her hand writing. It's too painful. And he means by I I can't imagine her handwriting, not only the script but the hand that is the uh, synecdoche for the whole person. Um, Greg, uh, Greg. We have two, yeah. time for around two more questions and then I think we'll have to move on to Fiona. Um, there's a question in the chat um, asking, was Keats hurt by Brown's vanishing? I was wondering about that, thank you. Um, and then we've also got Greg with his hand up. Well, just briefly, yes. I mean, to read Keats's letters, I mean, this was really painful for him, especially when he discovered um, when the Maria Cow Cowther landed, I mean, you know, was was in that those storms and had to sort of um, hang out before it could go further, that they actually went on land. And Keats found that that Brown had returned from Scotland and was only 10 miles away or something visiting um, uh, visiting, uh, uh, I think, relatives of the Dilks. Is that right, Nick? Was it the Dilks? And so yeah, Keats yeah, is just... really pained by Brown's unwillingness or inability or whatever. I mean, it's overdetermined to come to Italy with him. I mean, Brown thought that all Keats needed was spaghetti and a, a couple of good fucks and he would recover. And I, <laughs> Brown just really did, having you know been Keats's nurse for so long, um, Brown just, I think, didn't want to do it again and then tortured himself for the rest of his life for that moral failure. And Keats was deeply wounded by that. I mean, the last letter is to Brown, you know, and he can scarcely bid him goodbye, even in a letter. I always made an awkward bow. Mm. That's the end. So, um, yeah, no, that's, um, I mean, you know, and then to read Brown's life of Keats after that is to see how tortured Brown was by, um, uh, making the wrong call on that one. Greg? Yeah, uh, Susan, you, Susan, you probably know the stories about the uh, secretaries of Walter Jackson Bate uh, breaking down in tears as they were typing out the parts of uh, Bates' biography dealing with Keats's final weeks in uh, Italy. Do, do you find yourself also feeling a really intense, almost overwhelming identification um, with, with I gotta that say, this is a matter of days. suspense this morning because the two times I rehearsed this talk with Ron, my, my husband, I um, both of us broke down in tears. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this, of course, this is the power of Keats's writing is that, you know, it has, and it's always been, you know, when Byron says words are things, um, you know, this is, one of the magic and mysteries of writing that uh, mere words can produce that kind of reaction um, in a professional body. Um, but yeah, no, I, I do have that. And I mean, and, and the, you know, the strange thing about the artifact of Bates' massive biography, John Keats, is you know, the, the huge last quarter of it on Keats's demise. I mean, really almost day by day, pulse by pulse, to the point where you think that um, Bate and his team you know, have kind of fetishized um, the, this demise because it is so compelling. This brilliant boy with so much before him, just physically collapsing. Um, so yeah, Greg, that's a good question. And I mean, it is, I think, there are poems that I do not teach in class because I know I will weep to the confusion of my students. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked about this with other people too. I mean, that's one of the reasons we, you know, we're in this profession or in this, in, in this life is that literature has that amazing power, but Keats in particular in those last letters. Um, and also when you read them again, you know, the end is coming. I mean, that there is this sort of, 
you know, um, sad inevitability. You know how the story ends and you know how it's going to make you feel. Well, Susan, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your paper and for your generosity in us answering uh, all of those questions. There are, in fact, some more in the in the chat. If you, which I will get to. If, I if mean, you I, take yeah. a look, but thank I will, you. And I'll, I'll respond to everybody in the chat. You know, when when there's time. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for a brilliant paper to uh, set Midwinter Keats going, uh, and for your generosity in answering all those questions. Thank you. Katie's now going to uh, introduce uh, Fiona. Um, so um, I'll hand over now to uh, Katie Garner, my uh, colleague here at the School of English in St Andrews. Hello everyone and thank you Nick uh, and thanks Winifred too. Uh, it's a great pleasure of course to introduce Fiona, uh, Professor Fiona Stafford from the University of Oxford and Fellow of Somerville College. Fiona's recent work on Keats includes the wonderfully titled Keats Shoots and Leaves, an essay in Keats Places, edited by Richard Margrave Turley from 2018, and a forthcoming essay in the collection John Keats in Scotland, which is edited by Nicholas Rowe and me, uh, and which is published, uh, scheduled for publication in the next few months. But if you'd like to hear Fiona on Keats in Scotland, in the meantime, she's produced a wonderfully evocative radio documentary for the BBC, Keats Goes North, which you can listen to via the BBC Sounds app or online. Fiona's book, Local Attachments, The Province of Poetry, has quickly become a defining volume for anyone thinking about romantic poets and place, Keats included. Fiona is a nature writer, as well as an academic romanticist, and her work often draws on both interests, as in recent books such as The Long, Long Life of Trees, and the brief life of flowers. And her paper today also has an excellent and intriguing title, uh, what, the, what the Thrush Said. Thanks, Brianna. Thanks, Brianna. Oh, thank you very much, Katie. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, excellent. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I can't see myself, but that's fine. Yeah, we can. Um, yeah, we can. That's excellent. excellent. Oh, OK. okay. Um, I want to share my screen. I don't know if that's going to work. Shall I? I'll try. Right. OK, so I'm going to talk about what the thrush said to John Keats, as reported to John Hamilton Reynolds on the 19th of February. 1818. O thou whose face hath felt the winter's wind, whose eye has seen the snow clouds hung in mist, and the black elm tops among the freezing stars, to thee the spring will be a harvest time. O thou whose only book has been the light of supreme darkness, which thou feddest on night after night when Phoebus was away, to thee the spring shall be a triple morn. O fret not after knowledge, I have none. And yet my song comes native with the warmth. Oh, fret not after knowledge, I have none. And yet the evening listens. He who saddens at thought of idleness cannot be idle. And he's awake who thinks himself asleep. Now, the sonnet comes towards the end of a well-known letter, as I'm sure you know, um, in which Keats is musing on the creative benefits of passivity rather than the conscious pursuit of knowledge. He's justifying the apparent idleness uh, of a morning devoted to very little and certainly not to reading. And in case uh, Reynolds is unconvinced, um, Keats backs up his case with reference to the thrush. I have not read any books. The morning said I was right. I had no idea but of the morning, and the thrush said I was right, seeming to say, and then we get the sonnet. Now this is Keats um, in witty, whimsical mood, um, as his claim to have spent the morning doing nothing is counteracted uh, by the sonnet um, he's written to make the point. But as often in his letters, um, as, as we all know, and as Susan has uh, brought to our attention, a light-hearted tone doesn't mean uh, that what he says is necessarily inconsequential. Ventriloquizing uh, a non-human living creature was quite unusual for Keats, though he had to go to Daisy soon after this poem. 
But in his sonnets, he was more in the habit of addressing than of being addressed. The verse form he chooses for the thrush's song is also quite a departure um, from his usual practice. So I'd like to give some thought not just to what the thrush said, but how and why he said it and what it might tell us about Keats, his poetic development and his relationship with the natural world. What was it about the thrush that commanded Keats's attention on that bright February morning? Perhaps something akin to what prompted John Clare to include the thrush in the February section of the shepherd's calendar. Birds are hardly visible in Clare's January because of the harsh winter weather, but in the February poem, it begins with snow melting, the sun beginning to peep out and the reaction of the thrush. The mavis thrush with wild delight upon the orchard's dripping tree mutters to see the day so bright, spring scraps of young Hope's poesy. When Keats's editor, John Taylor, was revising Clare's verse for publication in 1827, he altered spring scraps of Young Hope's poesy to fragments of Young Hope's poesy, effectively removing the emphasis on the bird's spontaneous, unpolished response to the first sign of spring. But spring scraps are much more evocative of the song thrush than the more literary fragments, because scraps at root are the remains of food. Spring brings the sounds of the exuberant thrush um, as it starts scraping much needed sustenance from the melting earth. And spring scraps also suggest half remembered bits and pieces that may once again be put together to form a song. A song of the earth, natural, familiar, exciting as the hope of food and warmth after a long hard winter. In their book Wonderland, a year of Britain's wildlife day by day, the contemporary nature writers Brett Westwood and Stephen Moss include the song thrush on the 9th of February as their natural wonder of the day. It's one of the first birds to start singing in the new year after a long winter silence. And it's the familiarity um, of, of the thrush that makes it so welcome. This isn't a mysterious stranger, as you can see from these, these passages. The sound when it comes, is so familiar, it's as if I'm being greeted by an old friend, says Moss. It's been more than half a year since I first heard him, but the song thrush singing outside my bedroom window is, it seems, in a talkative mood. I listen as he pours out phrase after measured phrase, as if engaged in conversation with someone else, just out of my earshot. The choice of words here evokes the patterns of both language and music to convey the special fluency of the song thrush as he pours out phrase after measured phrase. The distinctive call also has peculiarly human qualities. Few birds, they say, are quite so defined by their sound as the song thrush. Perhaps this is because his diction is so human in tone, whereas the blackbird and robin are musical. The song thrush is chatty and loquacious, almost as if he's having a good gossip. So this isn't a muse or a blithe spirit. It's a down to earth British bird just chattering away. But at the same time, there's nothing random about it. He utters each phrase, then repeats it, usually modified a little, and then sings the original phrase again in a slightly different tone. For some listeners, this reiteration can seem rather tedious. Others regard it as one of the most beautiful of all our bird songs. And then they say that they far prefer it to the more popular, but rather predictable blackbird. The blackbird may be Mozart, but with his almost mathematical patterns, the song thrush is surely Johann Sebastian Bach. Patterns, repetitions, variations, refrains. The mathematical thrush is a particular kind of composer. For Keats, as evident in his sonnet, the mathematical thrush is a particular kind of poet. And we'll just go back to the poem. As Miriam Allot pointed out many years ago, Keats's repetitions in the poem, and this is what she says, may be the result of Keats's half-conscious attempt to imitate the melodic repetitions of the thrush's song. Now, I'm not sure why she assumed it was half-conscious. I mean, it seems to me entirely self-conscious as Keats is ventriloquizing the thrush he's heard that morning. It's chatty and loquacious, repeating its musical phrases. Just like every other thrush he or anyone else had ever heard. Indeed, the most obvious repetition in the poem comes when the words are most clearly those of the jubilant thrush. Oh, fret not after knowledge, I have none. Oh, fret not after knowledge, I have none. As the sestet begins, 
the thrush expresses himself most emphatically. And as we hear this exact phrase repeated, the earlier repetitions in the poem re-emerge because the matching exclamatory O's of lines 9 and 11 recall the vocative O's of O Thou Whose. Lines 1 and 5 then become retrospectively the thrush's characteristic utterance of a phrase and its repetition modified a little. O thou whose face hath felt the winter's wind, whose eye has seen the snow clouds hung in mist. O thou whose only book has been the light. Line five not only repeats the beginning of line one, O thou whose, but also the first, third and fourth words of line two. By echoing the opening lines, it's also opening further retrospective possibilities that the snow clouds could have been white to rhyme with light, that the winter's wind could be the winter's wind, a Shakespearean uh, suggestion encouraged by time and light, uh, but checked by its affiliation with winter. As you like it is echoing in the background here, blow, blow, thou winter wind, thou art not so unkind. And this suggestive technique gives the poem, I think, a provisional air, as if the lines might somehow alter perhaps as if they're spring scraps, half remembered from the year before. Something similar happens in line six. If this had read of supreme darkness on which thou feddest, then feddest would almost have rhymed with mist. But instead, the acoustic echo falls before the end, feddest on, and this allows on to look forward to mourn and none. Although this is an unrhymed sonnet, it's not entirely unrhymed. And if we attend to the start rather than the end of the lines, we find remarkable regularity. The openings are not so much rhymes as direct repetitions. So thou, O oh thou, to thee, to thee, O oh fret not, O oh fret not, and yet, and yet, with the final and he's picking up a row of ands and these. It's a kind of aural patterning that looks forward to the great spring odes a year later and the sonnet, if by dull rhymes, our English must be chained. And it's also a kind of back to front sonnet, a mirror, if you like, of the normal conventions. What the thrush said, uttered in an unrhymed yet rhyming poem that works acoustically, sounds natural, seems familiar, while at the same time is very fresh. It's instantly recognisable as sonnet, even though every romantic poet knew the defining feature of that form is the pattern of end rhymes, Petrarchan, Shakespearean, Italian, English, legitimate, illegitimate. To compose a sonnet without end rhymes is to invoke a very well-worn tradition and make it new. And this is, of course, what thrushes do each year as they begin to sing again after the winter. Now, I am sensible that this is all mere sophistication, Keats comments immediately after the sonnet, apparently referring to the clever reasoning he's been employing to excuse his indolence. But his comment also reveals a highly self-aware sense of the literary sophistication of his new poem which claims spontaneity and simplicity while being very knowingly crafted. Reynolds often seems to have brought out Keats' cleverness, serious thoughts about poetry and the creative process um, and highly innovative poetry being offered in a, a kind of throwaway tone. Keats' word order may result from rapid composition, but, but whether poured out or pondered on, the verbal juxtapositions multiply possibilities. Going back to line six, for example, the more colloquial order, which thou feddest on, rather than on which thou feddest, is not only rhythmically superior, but also allows the hint of a pun on which, because it falls immediately after supreme darkness. And this brings to mind another heavily rhymed and refrain filled poem written a few months later, it is the witching time of night where the use of repeated words and phrases explicitly link poetry, sleep, darkness with enchantment. In the later poem, the glistening stars are listening at the witching time of night. For what listen they? For a song and for a charm. The song of the thrush in the sonnet has a similar power to make the evening listen. It has its own song and charm to keep the freezing stars of winter at bay. Since we tend to read the sonnet in relation to the Reynolds letter, it seems to be a morning poem. Keats was led there by the beauty of the morning, operating on a sense of idleness. The morning said I was right. And yet in the sonnet, the thrush says the evening listens. 
whether he's been seeing all day or whether the evening um, is part of the winter darkness that's gradually giving away, giving way to the morn of spring, is open to debate. It may be both or neither. This is a poem of paradoxes where spring is anticipated as harvest time, supreme darkness described as a kind of light, the slumberer at the end awake. Now, the poem's often read not in the light of supreme darkness, uh, but in the light of Wordsworth's The Tables Turned, with its invitation to quit your books and come forth into the light of things and let nature be your teacher. Wordsworth's memorable thrush or throstle is singled out as no mean preacher. But although an important influence, it wasn't the only one. In February 1818, Keats was attending Hazlitt's lectures on the English poets, and as he reported to his brothers, in the lecture given on the 10th, Hazlitt had praised Thompson and Cooper while giving Crabbe an unmerciful licking. Hazlitt's damning assessment of the inanimate character of Crabbe's descriptions evidently startled Keats, whose first collection had only recently come out and whose long, really quite descriptive poem and Dimian uh, was about to appear. But Hazlitt's lecture had much to interest the poet concerned with the natural world. Hazlitt spoke confidently on the pastoral and natural description, and he emphasised the moving power of familiar natural phenomena. To him, he says, who has well acquainted himself with nature, nature's works, they speak always the same well-known language, striking on the heart amidst unquiet thoughts and the tumult of the world, like the music of one's native tongue heard in some far off country. Wordsworth's intimations, though, especially conveyed the emotional charge of natural phenomena familiar since childhood. The pansy at his feet, the rainbow coming and going. But has it also praised Cooper's natural imagery and feeling, singling out a description of a winter's walk at noon as one of the most feeling, elegant and perfect specimens of Cooper's style. And this, I think, may well have come to Keats's mind a few days later, when after weeks of winter weather, he heard the familiar voice of the thrush on that sunny February morning. I'll just move on to the next slide. Cooper is capturing the moment in the task um, when after a very cold night, suddenly the season smiles and has the warmth of May. This prompts thoughts on knowledge and wisdom and the distinction between them. This is what Cooper says, hear the heart may give a useful lesson to the head and learning wiser grow without his books. Knowledge and wisdom, far from being one, have oft times no connection. Knowledge dwells in heads replete with thoughts of other men. Wisdom in minds attentive to their own. Cooper then goes on to discuss the way in which books can enthrall and deceive their readers um, and then affirms the straightforward truth and courage of the natural world. I won't read all of this. You, you can see it. I hope on the slide, um, he talks about how, how trees and rivers and primroses deceive no one. Wisdom there and truth, not shy as in the world, and to be won by slow solicitation, sees at once the roving thought and fix it, fix it on themselves. So unlike knowledge, wisdom is at home in the countryside, at the retreat of winter. And both wisdom and truth are active powers, strong enough to seize the roving thought and effectively place the observing poet in a passive role. Now, there's no explicit mention of a, a thrush here, um, but Cooper's response to the first signs of spring, I think, may have sown a few seeds in Keats's mind, which were already germinating uh, when he took his walk a week later. Oh, fret not after knowledge, I have none, says the thrush, demonstrating his natural wisdom. Keats' poem plays on the limitations of carefully acquired knowledge and the abundance of what is freely known. And we might, I think, think of Hardy at dusk, hearing in the song of the darkling thrush, truths whereof he knew and I was unaware. Or Burns, stopping to listen to a thrush sing on a morning walk in January, and in so doing, seeing the winter retreat with a light, unanxious heart. For all the familiarity, of the thrush's song, however, there's still a mystery at its heart. There's something beyond the reach of human listeners. It's almost as if the bird is talking to someone else. You can hear him talking, but you don't know quite what he's saying. What the thrush knows is admired, but not fully fathomed by poets. 
Edward Thomas was acutely aware of this as he mused on all the facts he'd forgotten before dwelling on the mysterious continuity of the thrush's call. This is a, this is a poem called The Word. The thrush is called from year to year and that pure thrush word Thomas heard every spring repeated and repeated and still he couldn't fully understand it. The natural wisdom of the thrush is manifest in his song as Browning of course declared that's the wise thrush. He sings his song twice over. But it's the surprise, as well as the bird's familiarity, that tends to strike poets. Philip Larkin conveys the startling power of the thrush's fresh-peeled voice, astonishing the brickwork, in his poem Coming. It will be spring soon. It will be spring soon. Though so often resistant to hope, Larkin's encounter with the thrush made him feel like a child who comes on a scene of adult reconciling and can understand nothing but the unusual laughter and starts to be happy. The elderly Tennyson too finally wrote down a song um, in February 1889 that he'd begun years before. It's another thrush inspired lyric with abundant repetitions, um, refrains and acoustic patterns. I'll just read you a little bit of this. Summer is coming, summer is coming. I know it, I know it, I know it. Light again, leaf again, life again, love again. Yes, my wild little poet, sing the new year in under the blue. Last year you sang it as gladly. New, 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 new. Is it then so new that you should carol so madly? Now, when we start to gather together these thrush poems, a question arises almost unbidden. Do their repeated repetitions result from memories of earlier thrush poems? Do they come from books? Or do they come from the first-hand experience of the natural poet, the song thrush? While Keats's poem eschews the active pursuit of knowledge through reading in favour of passive receptiveness to nature, he is echoing other poets. But when we read his sonnet alongside some later poets, Hardy, Burns, Burns earlier, but Larkin, Tennyson, Clare, it seems that their poems aren't necessarily evoking each other, but rather attempting to capture something essential about the thrush and the first promise of spring. They may repeat each other, but their repetitions seem primarily responses to that natural singer whose repeating song is repeated in turn by generations of thrushes. And yet, Keats is and is not imitating the thrush as he ventriloquizes its song. For as soon as the thrush's song is translated into words, it inevitably comes something different from the original bird call. Words may resound and amplify through the acoustic qualities um, of their vowels and consonants, but they also always have linguistic meaning. They carry their own trails of associations. A poem may capture the rhythm of the thrush's call, but it still needs a sequence of meaningful words to achieve this. So very often the poetic thrush says what the poet wants to hear, just as he does in Keats's sonnet. And I want to um, show you what I mean through uh, an example, um, a less familiar example than, than Tennyson or, or, or Hardy or Edward Thomas. This is a traditional tale from the Outer Hebrides, which I will just very briefly briefly summarise. This is, this is a story of a man called Ian um, heading home after a, a rather heavy night in Castle Bay, uh, which is a, a town, uh, a little port on the southwest coast of the island of Barra. Overcome by the peace and quietness of the night, Ian falls asleep on the roadside. When he wakes up a few hours later, he's in such a sorry state that he vows never to touch another drop. But then he hears some beautiful music. It's a thrush calling out and saying, poor Ian, you are very dry. You are very dry. You are very dry. So Ian sighs and says to himself, well, the thrush is telling the truth. And even though I promised myself not to take another dram, I'd better take a drop. As he begins to feel a bit better, he notices that the thrush has changed its tune a little. And now it's saying, Ian, Ian, take another mouthful, take another mouthful which of course he does. Um, there's not much left in the bottle by this stage, but then he hears the thrush start up again. Ian, finish it, Ian, finish it, Ian, finish it. And once the bottle's empty, he goes back to Castle Bay and is one of the first into the pub that morning. Now there's a rich tradition of Gallic bird poems from 
the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, in which the rhythm and the sound of the words imitates particular bird calls. Um, so I want to um, play to you, if it's working, uh, a Gaelic, another Gaelic thrush. And for this, I'm indebted to a great friend of mine in the Isle of Skye, the Scottish composer uh, and poet, uh, John Purse. And now I'm hopefully not going to read the Gaelic if the sound is working. This is Aleph McCormack uh, reciting the poem. Um, and if you listen, you'll see how closely uh, she's uh, imitating the thrush. Morrison, come home, come home. What for? What for? To your dinner, to your dinner. What dinner? What dinner? Hard oatmeal bread, rye bread. Whee with it, whee with it. Be quick, be quick. So the thrush's call tends to be interpreted in very human terms. So often the bird becomes a mirror to what the listener is thinking. And Keats knew this. Two days after sending his thrush sonnet to Reynolds, he wrote to George and Tom, the thrushes and blackbirds have been singing me into an idea that it was spring. He knew that what he heard in the thrush's song was what he wanted to hear, that the songbird mirrored his wishes and his mood, and yet it remained mysterious and quite beyond his grasp of the world, being merely human, perhaps it was gently laughing at him. So although the thrush can and often does provide a mirror for the poet, it also remains a lamp, expressive, spontaneous, generous, full of life, and even in darkness, a source of inspiration and light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, for that tour through Thrush Poetry. That was absolutely brilliant. I think from the start of your talk where you mentioned that Keats is more in the habit of addressing uh, than inhabiting uh, the speaker. Was, was, oh, it's back. Oh, there we go. Back, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I can hear myself. Oh, no, I think that's sorted. Um, it was full of really rich observations um, and particularly how you ended by thinking about the thrush as mirror or lamp was, was fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? Oh, Susan, I can see that you have your hand up. So please go ahead. Unmute, okay. Hope I'm not getting any feedback. Um, that was great, especially the sort of material richness of, of what it would be to um, listen to and uh, try to imitate a thrush's song. Um, I'm interested in what you make of the sonnet form, you were just wonderful on how the repetitions, the sort of incremental pulsation of repetitions does the work of rhyme. Um, and this is Keats's uh, sole experiment in sort of blank verse quatorzane. Uh, and if you want to sort of say that the letter text leading into it is even part of the fun, uh, I'm wondering if, in the back of Keats's sonnet mind, at least, is the other famous fret not sonnet, which is Wordsworth's um, prefatory sonnet to his um, defense of a whole section of sonnets, nuns fret not at their narrow convent's room. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about, uh, if, if you care to, about Keats and uh, blank verse quatorzane tradition as a kind of fretting not with the sonnet form itself. If I can, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah thank I'm you. Gonna I'm gonna mute myself now. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think that that's of course very astute. The idea that he's uh, evoking nuns fret not in their in their narrow rooms. I think that that is probably in his mind as well. I mean, I think Wordsworth is very much in his mind. Um, but what I wanted to suggest is that thrushes are also in his mind and I think it's that's why I think it's quite helpful to put him in a, a slightly different context not of that immediate sort of giant influence but actually um, in parallel with lots of other poets who are you know just just listening to the natural world and and, and, and you know playing playing with those ideas I think at this stage having more or less you know he's just completed Endymion Keats is thinking about sonnet form. Um, he, he continues to experiment with it. That's why I think um, the If by uh, Dull Rhymes Our English Must Be Chained is quite an interesting poem to put next to this because there he's very much playing around with the tradition and coming up with a different sort of pattern of rhyme scheme. So I think it's something he, he does from time to time um, and he seems to be very much doing it here. I mean, the idea that this is blank verse is interesting, especially if he has been thinking about Cooper um, and, and whether you can turn, you know, blank verse into a sonnet. I mean, that's very much what Wurzer says about, um, about Milton, isn't it? And about Milton's sonnets in that, you know, that letter of 1802 and when Wurzer's has just been thinking about um, Milton's sonnets, he, he, he sort of admires them because he, he feels they have the kind of quality of, of blank verse in a in a sonnet um so um so so i think that, that that's that's interesting for keats as well but i but i do think um cooper's blank verse is is worth considering um i mean i haven't explored that in more detail but but other people other people may have done but it struck me that this passage of the the task uh, that Hazlitt had particularly read out at great length um, probably is feeding into into Keats's imagination and fusing with lots of lots of other things. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, I, 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 I have a question. I have a question. Uh, this is repeating uh, again. Repeating again. Uh, uh, I'm interested in the word triple um, that appears in the middle of of the poem, Fiona. Um, uh, uh, and listening to the thrush that you were, um, uh, the recording that you, you you gave us at the end, accompanying the Gaelic poem, uh, the thrush sings in triplets. It, it it doesn't sing in doubles. And I wondered if there was anything you'd want to say about that uh, structure, perhaps the idea of triplets in relation uh, to the poem. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... That's really, really interesting, and you can see that Tennyson's picking up on the on the triplets in his in his poem. Um, I mean, I think I think thrushes vary a bit, um, and sometimes they, you know, sing the song twice over, and sometimes they 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 do it in triples. But I, I think that absolutely would explain. I hadn't particularly thought about that next, so thank you very much. I think that would explain why it's why it's a triple mourn um, rather than a double mourn or whatever, because the 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 thrush will. You know, have one of his phrases more more than once, uh, more than twice, more than three times, even. Um, so yeah, no, that that seems absolutely absolutely spot on. Though it's interesting, it's the thrush saying to the poet to be the the spring will be a triple morn, isn't it? Um, so um, so yeah, I'll have to have a I have to have a kind of careful look through the poem to to look for other triples because the 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 doubling is is obvious, um, but I think the O's. Uh, a kind of quadruple when you look at the the beginnings <laughs> the beginnings of the lines you you get these kind of repeat repeats and and, and repetitions um so i think yeah triple triples right i think i think triple as well the spelling of it suggests a kind of ripple too doesn't it so so i think with keats he, he is kind of playing around with um puns and you know the the look of words as well and how they're suggesting I ideas in the, in the mind so i do think it's a very very kind of interesting experimental as i say provisional sort of sonnet so so there's this sense of, i think there's this sense of possibility in the sonnet um and these little sort of clues and suggestions and triples another one which i hadn't particularly thought of but absolutely it's obviously immediately occurred to you um and, and that seems to me absolutely right for what he's trying to convey that sort of sense that spring is is possible but it hasn't quite arrived so there's that sort of sense that 
it's going to happen um and i think the whole poem is kind of pulsing with with possibility really um so yeah so thank you that, that was very helpful thank you there's some great, there's comments, some great on comments on other thrush poetry in the chat um from lisa vargo and from from sarah Wooten. but i'll read out some of the bits from the uh, the chat um bob white mentions that several references to thrush in uh, to thrush, the thrush in letters to Fanny Braun in 1820, um, and Lisa Vargo um, mentions John Clare's sonnet, The Thrush's Nest, where he focuses not just on the joy of the bird's song, but its secret toil of building a nest and the description of the eggs. Uh, she says, simply another thrush poem from a poet who wrote, wrote brilliantly about birds and their nests. Um, Sarah Wooten uh, says, uh, mentions Charlotte Smith's Ode to the Missile Thrush, which might be of interest, the bird for Smith speaker held the spring once and quote, the winter solstice is past. Smith has an interesting footnote. Um, so I don't know if you want to re uh, respond to any of those suggestions, Fiona. Yes, those are, those are all very helpful. Um, I mean, I think it, it is quite interesting in this period um, to know how clear people were about the difference between say a sung thrush uh, and, and a mizzle thrush uh, because they didn't have the same sort of resources that we have uh, and the sort of body of ornithology that that, that we have um, to distinguish things but uh, I'm, I'll have I'll have a look at uh, Charlotte Smith's footnote thank you thank you Sarah that's really helpful I mean I think I think the thing about um, um, you know Claire's thrush's nest ab absolutely spot on I mean he's, he's talking about thrush building building its nest and I think that um, I mean Claire I think there's lots to say about Claire and Keats actually and, uh, and birds which would be interesting but those those spring scraps I could have said more about um, that sense of building a song out of remembered bits and pieces um, seems to me quite like building a nest out of out of bits and pieces which is of course what you know what, what the thrush's nest is is all about um, and it's interesting. I was reading um, just just yesterday Judith Chernock's um, recent essay about whether um, Kisses Nightingale is in fact uh, a song thrush. So if anyone hasn't read that yet, they might be interested to to do that. I mean, she she talks quite a bit about some of the references um, to the thrushes in in the late letters and the correspondence with with Fanny um, and, and and Keats' fondness um, for the thrush. He says he's a he's a fine fellow, and it seems to have been a bird that has special meaning for them. Um, but I think that's probably uh, not the case um, in in this particular. The particular poem I was I was talking about, um, but it's interesting to see how Keats obviously thinks very hard about thrush at this point, and and it, it becomes a kind of even more important bird um, as we as we go on with his short life. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating point about the scraps as well. Um, I hadn't thought about that at all. So that's um, just brilliant. Um, if there aren't any other questions, maybe we should go to to the break. Seems, yeah. seems very good. Uh, and to, just to end by thanking Fiona uh, very much for her splendid talk. Thank you so much. So I think we've got 10 minutes um, for a break and we'll start again just after uh, UK time, half past four. So that's 10 minutes uh, to get a cup of tea or coffee. reminder that um, Susan's book On He Flared, Essays on Four Letters of John Keats, is available from the Keats Shelley House at Rome. So you need to get onto the website of the Keats Shelley House at Rome uh, and click on, I think, the button that says shop or something similar, and you'll find Susan, Susan's book on sale there for 10 euros, uh, and it can be uh, mailed to you, I'm sure. Our third speaker uh, at Midwinter Keats is Winifred Liu, who is a PhD student at the School of English in the University of St Andrews. Winifred successfully completed an MPhil dissertation last year on Keats and the theatre, uncovering many new aspects of Keats's interest, particularly in the London theatre world. Uh, out of that dissertation came a fascinating article, Keats, Keane and Othello, published in 
uh, notes and queries in September, uh, notes and queries in September last year. It's a fascinating article that pu pushes back to an earlier date, Keats's first encounter with uh, Edmund Keane and the London theatre world. So it's an important uh, revision of our understanding of Keats's response to contemporary theatre. Uh, Winifred is currently working on a PhD thesis on Keats and religion, but for her paper today, she's going to go back to uh, Keats and the theatre uh, and take us to the remote west coast of Scotland, uh, where Keats encountered Kotzebue's play, The Stranger. Uh, please welcome Winifred Liu to speak to us now on Keats and The Stranger at Inverary. Thank you for your introduction to me, Nick, and thank you for mentioning my first publication, NNQ. The paper is titled uh, Keats and the Stranger at Inverary. On Monday, 22nd, June 1818, Keats and his friend Charles Armitage Brown set off on their walking tour of Northern England and Scotland. Almost a month later, on Friday, 17th of July, they arrived at Inverary on the western shore of Loch Fyne. After seeing the Duke of Argyll's castle, the two men read a playbill on entering Inverary, advertising Augustus von Kotzebue's play The Stranger to be staged at a makeshift playhouse inside a barn. Charles Brown had blistered his feet with his new shoes, so Keats went alone to the performance and complained at length about it in a letter to Tom Keats dated Saturday, 18th of July. So I went to the barn alone where I saw the stranger accompanied by a bagpipe. There they went on about interesting creatures and human nature till the curtain fell and out came the bagpipe. When Mrs. Holler fainted, down went the curtain and out came the bagpipe. At the heart rending, shoe mending reconciliation, the piper blew a mane. I never read or saw this play before. Not the bagpipe, nor the wretched players themselves were little in comparison with it. Thank heaven it has been scoffed at lately almost to a fashion. The location of the barn where Keats saw the stranger has never been established, but by investigating maps and footstepping across Inverary in July 2020, I have managed to find it. But first, here is where Inverary is on the map, just in case if anyone is not too certain. Inverary's redevelopment was commissioned by the third Duke of Argyll in the 1740s, and the Scottish architect, William Adam, was appointed to rebuild a castle in addition to a new town. Construction work spanned over 40 years, and when William Adam died in June 1748, his eldest son, John Adam, took over and finished the castle as well as Inverary Inn and the townhouse. Construction was stalled by the fourth Duke of Ardgau between 1761 to 1770, but after his death, his successor appointed Scottish architect Robert Milne to continue the construction from 1772 to 1800. Inverary's church was designed and built by Milne, and he was also partly responsible for the construction of the town's original barn theater. The town's barn theater was initially located a, a kilometer northwest of Inverary Castle in a complex called Mountland Square. A field survey carried out by the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland in October 1986 reported that a riding school some 44 meters in length was employed as a hay barn and much used for amateur theatricals before being gutted by fire in 1817. It was restored much later in 1897 as Jubilee Hall, well after Keats's death. The performance Keats attended was then relocated to another barn on the southeast shore, known as the Fisherlands, built circa 1774 behind a row of single-story cottages called Barn Bray. It exists to this day under the same name as a Category C listed building that's currently at risk. British listed buildings describe the structure as a substantial two-story gabled rectangular barn 
with distinctive narrow slitted openings that has played embrasures to the upper level with six on the side walls and three to each gable. The guide notes that the interior once had a cobbled floor and a timber beamed roof, which perhaps made it an appropriate venue as a temporary playhouse well sheltered from the weather. One can still see the barn standing behind the row of cottages today, although it now lies in ruins. Only the four outer stone walls remain. Its doors are mostly sealed and an upper story has disappeared. The roof, as you can see, is completely gone. It was most likely in this building that Keats saw the stranger accompanied by a bagpipe. The Stranger, originally published by Kotzebue as Misanthropy and Repentance in 1789, first premiered at Drury Lane on Saturday, 24th of March, 1798, after Sheridan adapted it into English under its current title. More English translations of the text followed after Sheridan's success. And in Keats's time, a widely available version was Benjamin Thompson's translation published in his anthology, The German Theater, in 1801. The plot is briefly as follows. In a village near a castle lives the misanthropic stranger who complains of domestic strife. Mrs. Haller, the other protagonist, works at Count Winterson's castle as a governess. When the stranger saves Count Winterson's son from drowning, the Count invites him to dinner and the stranger and Mrs. Haller faint upon seeing each other. Baron Steinfurt, a common friend, then realizes that Mrs. Haller is the stranger's estranged wife and attempts to reconcile the couple by letting them meet with their children. After a tearful confession, during which Mrs. Haller claims she is undeserving of her husband's forgiveness as she had eloped with another man, the family reconciles in a hug thus cobbling up what Keats called the heart-rending, shoe-mending reconciliation as the Piper blew a main. While theater in England was of course a common form of entertainment in Keats's time, acting was met with resistance in many parts of Scotland throughout the 18th century, largely because the Church of Scotland thought plays and the actors' promiscuity promoted immorality. Performances were hosted by touring companies with a royal patent, but following the 1737 Licensing Act, many unpatented playhouses were forced to close. Religious intolerance led to the first theater at Glasgow being burned down in an arson attack in 1757. And as a result, theater was not regularly staged in Scotland until about after 1780 since not many theaters were built and even fewer actors were available. Here, for example, is a street theater in Aberdeen from 1848. From the impoverished appearance of its props and actors, one can deduce that life in provincial Scottish theater was an extremely tough one. The only popular exception was John Holmes Douglas, first station Edinburgh in 1756. And thus, Scotland's theatre revival came later with adaptations of Sir Walter Scott's novels and with playwright Joanna Bailey's works. Scottish provincial theatre gradually gained popularity in the early 19th century, and small performances like the one Keats saw in Inverary were not completely spontaneous events. Adrian Scullion informs us that these informal playhouses were later equipped with a well-established network of fit up stages in smaller towns where a string of touring companies played versions of Shakespeare in addition to various Scottish plays. While the choice to stage Kotzebue's The Stranger at Inverary may have been comparatively unusual, many of his plays had appeared on the English stage in translated and adapted versions. However, what Keats encountered in, at Inverary was not an elaborately furnished London theater with a well-known cast. On the contrary, he saw the production on a roughly assembled set with a cast of local or itinerant actors and a strong Scottish inflection that was not present in the original play script. That is bagpipe music to which I will return. Although Keats mentions in his letter that he never read or saw this play before, 
Rollins conjectures in his footnotes that Keats might have read a parody of it by James Smith in the satirical rejected addresses. Furthermore, The Stranger was staged multiple times from 1815 to 1818 at Covent Garden Theatre and at Drury Lane. Throughout February to May in 1815, in January, March, and November in 1816, in June, August, and October in 1817, in May, June, October, and December 1818 through to January 1819. While the performances here are not exhaustive, these frequent stagings suggest that Keats would almost certainly have known of the play either from reviews or popular report. Long after The Stranger's debut on the English stage in 1798, Bell's Weekly Messenger published an unfavorable review of a performance on Sunday, 13th of May, 1818, beginning with, the audience were better pleased with the play than we were. The review then claims that the play compromises female chastity. In English life, no one, we presume, ever saw the like or wishes to see it. The common and general reprobation of women in such a situation is perhaps one of the best securities of the peace of families, the order of inheritance, by ensuring the strict observance of the marriage vow. The Stranger of Kotzebue is about a sentimental sequel to Charlotte and Werther. Werther, the one tempts to infidelities, the other shows how humane and gentlemanlike it is to pardon them. This review might well be one of the instances Keats had in mind when he said that the play had been scoffed at. Unusually for a review in the London papers, there is no commentary on the performance of the actors nor is there a summary of the plot. As seen above, the review is solely concerned with the apparent immorality of Kotzebue's play. An earlier review from The Sun, dated Thursday, 23rd of October, 1817, focused on how the principal actors constituted another irresistible appeal to the feelings of the audience. The stranger drew a large and splendid audience to the theater last night, Young, who adopts the masterly outline of Campbell in The Stranger, fills it with judgment, sensibility, and expression, strongly interested the feelings of the audience, particularly in the first meeting between him and the Baron, and in his pathetic recital of his domestic miseries. Miss O'Neill, as Mrs. Holler, was not less powerful in exciting general sympathy. The lack of plot summary in both of these reviews suggests that The Stranger had been staged frequently enough for readers to be acquainted with its narrative. Both reviews noticed that the play had moved the audience, but as Bell's Weekly Messenger sarcastically pointed out, that might have been for a questionably humane fascination with people's infidelities. In view of the play's dubious reputation, as suggested by the newspaper reviews, Keats's letter to Tom suggests that he might have known more about the play than he said. While complaining about the bagpipes, Keats comments on the end of Act Four when Mrs. Holler fainted, and about the rather contrived conclusion of the play with the heart-rending, shoe-mending reconciliation, which seems to echo the mocking tone in Bell's Weekly Messenger. In order to understand what Keats was writing about, Tom would have needed some knowledge of the play. And Keats's comment, thank heaven has been scoffed at lately, almost to a fashion, reveals that the brothers also knew about the rough reception the stranger had recently received, despite apparently not having read the original translation. The performance of the stranger at Inverary certainly left an impression on Keats, as he dedicated a short poem to it called Of Late Two Dainties, in which he jokingly claims that the bagpipes did steal his heart away. First, the bagpipe mourned with zealous haste. The stranger next with bosom bent, sigh rueful again the piteous bagpipe went. Again, the stranger sighs fresh did waste. Despite Keats's poor report of the stranger and its Scottish inflections, the fact that he left his friend behind to see the play gives a suggestive insight 
and to the poet's passion for theater and how he used his theatrical experiences to fuel his poetic creativity. Compare these two couplets in The Stranger, for example. And when pale characters of death shall mark this altered cheek, when my poor wasted trembling breath, my life's last hope would speak. With these lines in Keats's La Belle Dame Saint Merci, I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy rose, and on thy cheeks, a fading rose fast with us too. The couplets from The Stranger were sung to a tune of Mrs. Holler's expressing the latter's guilt and regret. Since her elopement, Mrs. Holler had the keener marks of sorrow and confusion upon her altered cheek. And now she spends the remainder of her solitary life in a kind of limbo, rather like the palely loitering knight at arms in Keats's poem. Kotzebue's play also includes the phrase, a better world as a rather unusual and morbid form of, of consolation. It first appears in the play when an old peasant receives help from Mrs. Holler. To be sure I can expect but little joy before I die. Yet there is another and a better world. The phrase appears again at the ending of the play when Mrs. Holler tells her husband, when we meet again in a better world. While Kotzebue's use of death in the, po in the play is romanticized as a promise of the protagonist's rebirth and reconciliation, Keats's poem terminates inconclusively so, as he expressed explicit dislike of the play's original ending. Similarly, the, lies, the lines sighed, rueful again the piteous bagpipe went, again the stranger sighing's fresh did waste, and of two late dainties are echoed by, she took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore in La Belle Dame Saint Merci. As Keats was an avid reader of the examiner, he would have found out about Kotzebue's assassination in the 4th of April, 1819 issue. And he told the George Keatses that the playwright had been murdered lately and a letter dated 15th of April in the same year. At some point over the next, at some point over the next two weeks of writing this letter, Keats composed La Belle Dame Saint Merci. Perhaps in some way, it was a response to the news of Kotzebue's demise. I would also suggest that Keats was weaving his memories of Scotland's The Stranger into the language strange of this enigmatic and death-infected ballad. In this way, Perhaps the empty shell of an old Barnet Inverary may help to tell us about Keats's creativity than what we might have initially expected. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Winifred. Um, a, a remarkable paper taking us all the way from uh, the ruin of, of uh, Barn Theatre at Inverary uh, through to uh, the London world of, of the theatre where The Stranger was so often performed that it's difficult to believe uh, Keats was not uh, more familiar with the play uh, than perhaps we might have realised. And also uh, for the very suggestive way in which you um, linked uh, the text of Kotzebue's play um, with uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. And we now have some time for some questions. Um, I, I have a question, but perhaps Richard has a question as well. Um, anybody uh, like to uh, start uh, with questions for Winifred? Okay, well, while people are thinking, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the, the possible background to this performance of The Stranger at Inverary? Um, have you looked in um, any Scottish newspapers to see if uh, this um, travelling troupe of players, as I suppose they must be, had been performing anywhere else? Uh, for example, at Oban or elsewhere on the west coast of Scotland. 
Uh, yes, um, as I mentioned in my paper, unless you were contracted at the Edinburgh Theatre, then the rest of the time these touring companies would go from Newcastle and then down to the southwest bit of Scotland, and then they would move all the way up to Glasgow and then around the western coast. I'm not sure if Oban was one of the locations for touring companies, because when I looked in the Scottish newspapers, most of the performances concentrated um, at Glasgow, Edinburgh, as well as these towns that have holiday visitors. I suppose that is where they make their money as well, because during the theatre season, which is when everybody leaves the capital after Parliament um, to go holiday, that's where the majority of the money would come in. And once you take a look at the Scottish newspapers, you can also see that these touring companies don't always stay in the big cities, despite that would probably be, be where most of the income came in um, because um, the theater industry made more money down in England than wherever the holiday makers went. I suppose the touring companies followed instead of the other way around. And research wise, it also made it quite difficult to track any pre-planned performances in the Scottish newspapers because um, quite often they were planned spontaneously when they knew that guests were in the area. Yeah. Uh, but yes. Okay, any, any other questions for Winifred? Richard? Yeah, thanks, Fred. It's fantastic. And just battening onto that echo that you found there, which I thought was extremely suggestive, perhaps you could just say a little more about the process by which you, you, you think that those echoes make their way into La Belle Dame. Um, I, uh, when I read the play script for The Stranger, uh, I noticed that there was this incredibly long scene with no, you know, kind of bearing on the plot whatsoever. And it was Mrs. Holler's song that I just mentioned. And I saw that she kept on sort of like focusing about sighs, sighings, and being solitary in a castle in a different country where she is essentially repenting. And when I first looked at La Belle Dame Saint Merci, the last stanzas of the poem where pale knights were loitering just struck me as well, what did they do to like end up in that elfin grotto? Um, and I think that was what drew me to compare the play as well as the poem. And I was also quite intrigued by the concept of language strange in La Belle Dame. In Keats's letters back home and also in his um, funny lines, I suppose, about the bagpipes. Uh, he was complaining about how he couldn't understand most of what people were saying up in Scotland. And I thought, if you couldn't understand it, and the actors that were playing had a very, very heavy accent, then perhaps in addition to the bagpipes that kept on interrupting the performance, he was looking at this play in a language strange because you couldn't understand any of the Scottish inflections. Um, so now you have Keats going on his walking tour of Scotland. He's away from home. He is surrounded by people whose speech he cannot understand. And he's confronted with the sight of a woman sort of like sat on the stage and it's always just her and the play script. She almost always shows up alone. And she's sighing, she's talking about how she's done all of the wrong things and she's sitting by a ledge, not doing her work as a governess, I suppose. <laughs> and I thought, oh, all right, uh, if 
Kotzebue came up at around the same time that he was writing La Belle Dame Saint Merci, then I reckon he might have recalled the play by Kotzebue as well mm. that he saw in Scotland. Uh, I, I think that's exactly right. I think the the, the the murder, the news of the murder of Kotzebue is is an important link here, uh, in in um, uh, early eighteen nineteen. I think Carol Kairos Walker has got a question for you, but this, um, uh, it's not on the chat column. I don't know if Carol is is there and can put her question in person. I am here, and I. I think I said in the chat what I wanted to say that my compliments to Winifred, it was a beautiful job of research. And I was thrilled that you found the barn and did that great research on the barn and the design of the barn. That was such an impressive thing for me anyway, particularly my, uh, my interest. The whole paper was fascinating. Um, I, I hope it will be published and I hope I can read it on the pages when it's published. Please keep me posted. I will, thank you. <laughs> Are there any any other questions for, for Winifred? There's, the, Ian Reynolds is wondering if you looked at Alan Cunningham's The Mermaid of Galloway uh, and Keats's uh, uh, and John Hamilton Reynolds' poem The Naiad, A Tale. Have you looked at any of those? No, I must confess I haven't, but thank you very much. I will immediately. Okay. Are there any, any further questions? Um, there's there's lots of uh, welcoming comment uh, in the chat column, so I think perhaps um, we should thank Winifred very much for that first paper um, on uh, uh, the disused barn uh, in Inverary, where Keats certainly uh, attended um, uh, Kotzebue's uh, play. So next time you're in Inverary. Uh, head for the seafront and look behind the terrace of, of houses that are there. Um, it's a protected building um, and the Keats Association should be perhaps um, more widely known. And uh, Midwinter Keats is, is perhaps the first time that this has been um, uh, announced more widely uh, than um, in, in Winifred's original dissertation. So thank you, uh, Winifred, for a brilliant presentation. Um, as a, 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 an interlude between Winifred's paper and our final panel, I need to let you know that uh, Susan Wilson's book, On He Flared, is available from the bookshop at the Keats Shelley House in Rome. Uh, you can get it simply on the website uh, and you'll, you'll find, I think it says shop or something like that. And um, you can order it there as I'm sure uh, you'll be keen to do. Um, so on to our, our final uh, panel, we have um, three speakers, all of them very well known uh, to us, Greg Kusich, Beth Lau uh, and Daniel Johnson. And I've been given a script to read out by way of an introduction. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, introduce them, all three of them, collectively uh, with the following words. Beth Lau, Daniel Johnson and Greg Kusich have been working collectively as a trio in recent years, completing several significant and interrelated Keats projects. They have published many books and articles on Keats, as well as other topics in 18th and 19th century British literature. Over the last several years, their collaboration has issued in a digital edition of Keats's heavily marked and annotated copy of Milton's Paradise Lost. They organized a major international conference in London on Keats and intertextuality. Uh, you'll remember this was called uh, Keats's Reading uh, and Reading Keats. And there'll be a collection of essays uh, forthcoming from that conference. Uh, entitled uh, Keats's Reading, Reading Keats, uh, and, and that's coming um, from Palgrave in uh, the, the next few months. They're going to be discussing all of these projects uh, for us uh, this afternoon. Beth Lau, as you'll know, is Professor Emerita at California State University, Long Beach. Daniel Johnson specializes in 18th and early 19th century British literature at the University of Notre Dame. 
where he also holds the position of digital humanities and English literature librarian. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure for us all to see Greg Kusich fully recovered from uh, his very serious operation uh, last year. Greg is professor of English at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and I think perhaps this is the first presentation he's given uh, since his operation. They, uh, they asked me to assure you that despite the many surprises and occasional setbacks in these interrelated projects, all three of them remain happily collaborative scholars and very good friends. So without further ado, um, here are Beth Lau, Daniel Johnson, Johnson and Greg Kutich. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay, um, um, Uh-oh. I hear an echo. Let's see. It's been taken care of. Oh, okay. Um, well, thank you to everyone for attending and thanks very much to Nick for inviting us to participate in this delightful conference. Um, I've been asked to begin our session by explaining the origins of our Keats's Reading, Reading Keats multi-stage project. Um, I've long been interested in Keats's reading of other writers and the role his reading played in his own creative process. In 1998, I published Keats's Paradise Lost, which is a transcription and analysis of all the notes and markings in Keats' copy of Milton's poem. The marginalia provide a fascinating record of not only how Keats responded to Paradise Lost, but in many ways, how he read poetry generally. As the decades went on and the internet expanded, it became increasingly clear that a better format for presenting Keats's marginalia would be a digital edition, showing scans of the actual pages of Keats's book and his handwritten comments, underlining and vertical lines in the margins. To create such an edition, however, I knew I would have to find a collaborator to handle the digital component of the project since I am a technological ignoramus. So for a number of years, I cast about for such a person without success. Susan Wolfson had frequently expressed her support for an online edition of Keats's Paradise Lost Marginalia and encouraged me to pursue the project. In 2016, she told me about a recent PhD student of hers, Dan Johnson, who had been hired at University of Notre Dame as a digital humanities specialist and who she thought might be interested in working with me. She gave me Dan's email address and the rest, as they say, is history. Dan was interested in the project and perhaps just as important, his dean agreed to fund it. Dan and I thought it would be helpful to include on our team someone from the English faculty at Notre Dame and the obvious, indeed the perfect person to invite to join us was Greg Kusich, longtime friend of mine and author of a book on Keats's reading of Spencer, which includes an analysis of Keats's marginalia and the fairy queen. Dan is going to take over now and describe our digital edition of Keats's Paradise Lost, but I will just conclude by saying that Dan did an absolutely fantastic job creating the website, and it has been a real pleasure working with him and Greg on our three-stage project of website conference and collection of essays. Thank you very much uh, for introducing that for us, Beth. I will echo my uh, great appreciation and warmth for this project team. It's been uh, fun from start to finish, even in uh, uh, working through the roadblocks. So it's been great. Um, could someone briefly tell me whether you see the Keats uh, Midwinter Conference uh, projected on your screen? I yeah. see some nods, so yeah. we can jump right in, which is great, uh, because I'd like to uh, start <clears throat> this presentation by looking at the first term in our panel title here, website conference and volume, uh, because I think it's a vexed term. Uh, websites are notoriously unstable and it is not always clear what they are trying to achieve. Is a scholarly website a new edition or simply a surrogate of something already printed uh, and hence perhaps destined to quick disintegration? 
or perhaps the website is an archive, some kind of platform, maybe even a scholarly commons, uh, right? Hovering over all these configurations, however, is the specter of longevity. Will whatever it is outlast the decade? And then what ultimately are the implications for the scholarly record or even just rereading in the digital ecosystem? So to better uh, understand and think through these questions and also shed light on the problem we editors were seeking to address, I propose first to break the book, as it were, to borrow a phrase of Laura Mandel's, for a book is where this panel ends with the volume of essays and a book is where the whole enterprise started with Keats's 1807 annotated Paradise Lost, of course, but also, and I think especially Beth's 1998 University of Press Florida edition of the same. Beth's modern print volume is a majorly uh, scholarly accomplishment uh, that also bucks against the limitations of its format as uh, Beth hinted at. She was able to include only transcripts of the passages of the Paradise Lost that exhibited annotations, um, not the unmarked passages, um, and uh, had to typographically recreate Keats's system of lineation the best she could using the word processing technology of the time while adding only a precious few low resolution page scans. Anything more comprehensive would have strained the finances of the project, perhaps exacerbated rights questions and ultimately rendered the physical book itself more cumbersome. So the compromises of the print monograph could reproduce a semblance of the original, but uh, these absences were sorely missed. The advancement of digital technologies since 1998 seemed to present the uh, perfect opportunity um, and solution to these problems. Freed from the cost and formatting entanglements of print, it was easy to imagine that a web edition of some kind could be more comprehensive, but when pressed for specifics uh, of a comprehensive web edition, the project became complicated. Um, what should be included and relatedly, how could it be preserved ideally in perpetuity as Beth's book would be? This is where we need to break the book as it were and examine its constituent components before envisioning what our digital edition might do in the specificity of its own medium. So I like to think through a lens of print technology in this kind of in the vein of Jerome McGann and uh, break the book into constituent bibliographic components such as the following. So we have W and J Deas's 1807 printing of Paradise Lost and its little dual decimal size. Uh, standing behind that specific copy, we have in essence an ideal work that we call uh, Milton's Paradise Lost from which the various specific manifestations, including the 1807 deus, derive and potentially diverge in significant ways. Uh, we can divide our particular deus printing into more specific components too, such as simply the plain text uh, as rendered, uh, as well as the visual instantiation of the text on the page, encompassing everything from typeface to the divergence of poetic line from the printed line because of the book's small size uh, to the text's juxtaposition uh, with decorative imagery. And um, then furthermore, on top of this, literally on top of this, we have Keats's handwritten annotations. And in fact, we can break these annotations into further types as well. We have the marginalia, which are both textual transcript, uh, textual content, as well as visual appearance of Keats's longhand on the page. Then we have another type of annotation uh, which we call lineation, which we may similarly divide between a graphical appearance on the page, as well as their apparent function as indicators of, I guess we could call textual extent. Now, moving forward in time to Beth's intervention, we add a scholarly apparatus, which includes endnotes, chapters of in-depth analysis and interpretation, uh, cross-referencing in the form of scholarly annotations. And finally, we should not neglect uh, the bibliographic tools and navigational aids of the book, such as indices, tables of contents, headings, even the cachet and imprimatur of a scholarly publisher. 
a creative bibliographic scholar could no doubt go on extending this list uh, of technologies and histories embedded in the print book. The point is that the multitude of constituent components, many of them subtle or hidden, demands choices from would-be editors. Uh, given this panoply, how can a digital version remedy the disadvantages of the print volume while mitigating the limitations and also leveraging the affordances of the new digital medium? How can the broken book be reconstituted most logically on the web? Again, the low hanging fruit in our eyes was a complete digital facsimile the Keats Paradise Lost held by Keats House. Since 1998, digital image standards had settled, price per megabyte uh, had dropped by orders of magnitude and cultural institutions have bought equipment capable of very high resolution photography indeed. Uh, if worse came to worse then and this whole internet fad uh, came to an end. We reasoned that scholars could schlep around a full copy of the image set on a thumb drive and reasonably expect to open it uh, if you could find a functional computer. The standards are sufficiently universal and mature that unlike uh, 1988 thesis uh, written on WordStar or your 1995 GeoCities website, page scans should survive everything short of extinguishment of computation as such. Not bad. However, this very flexibility and sustainability presented a roadblock because a digital facsimile appears very much uh, more like an archive than an edition, which can make the actual archive holding the physical artifact understandably nervous. Um, publishing a few relatively low resolution page scans uh, for a limited print run, that's one thing, but opening up minutely detailed photographic reproductions to the entire world is quite another. It invites suspicion that uh, such an operation may militate against visits to the archive and revenues. Even though evidence suggests digitization increases engagement with physical holdings, uh, the suggestion of hazard remains vivid to risk management. Nor would this operation be free. If intellectual property challenges could be solved, then material handling, equipment use, staff time, usage rights would still need to be accounted for. So here we turned to Notre Dame's Hesburgh Library for financial support, pitching this project as collection development. Uh, this strategy also entailed potentially store, storing the images on the university institutional repository in a structured and sustainable way, freeing us editors from long-term care of those files at least, uh, all to the good. However, from their perspective, uh, Notre Dame could not expect to invest resources from capital outlay to computer infrastructure in material that might be restricted in any way from users. Uh, so you can kind of see a logistical teeter-totter being set into play here. It was unclear how far Keats House might press restrictions or assert rights since Keats's Paradise Lost is on the one hand, clearly a printed volume uh, that's out of the limitations of copyright, but yet at the same time, also a manuscript work which operates from a separate regime from copyright. So how would that work? Uh, even the low hanging fruit of page scans then uh, proved resilient against plucking and these transatlantic negotiations proved one of our, our largest time investments. However, Keats House throughout was very good to work with, and we ultimately uh, found essentially an end run around the problem uh, through contractual agreement. Rather than conduct a master course in intellectual property legalities, we agreed that Notre Dame could hold and offer in perpetuity the full high resolution images, uh, while Keats House would retain permissions rights which would be indicated by a note adding to the metadata record as well as affixed visually to every image as thus. So far, so good. But again, this was a great deal of work for just one bibliographic dimension. We editors do not want just an archive of the page images stored on an institutional repository. Um, recall again, all the other bibliographic components that we have extracted from the physical book. For example, to focus on one, transcriptions. Uh, as Beth pointed out in 98, a transcription offers the advantage of enhanced legibility, especially for handwritten material, uh, but for the type, uh, type material as well. Um, now in the digital realm, transcriptions also present a new affordance that we know as text search, which truly plays to the strength of the medium. Because the digital is not well suited to a cover to cover reading. I think many would agree. Uh, that's why I feel anyway. And it would be painful to hunt and peck through image after image to use the text. 
Instead, a user is more likely to want to type in a word and immediately jump through the text uh, to the relevant bits and analyze the page facsimiles there. Or perhaps even more likely, a user wishes simply to jump from one Keats marginal note to the next and skip over textual content or lineation until later. So adding the plain text transcription would aid legibility, <clears throat> similar to the printed book, but it would also accommodate the rhizomatic reading practices of the digital user by enabling control F text searching, maybe some kind of a replacement for the index of the physical book. Another bibliographic component we certainly wanted to include <clears throat> was a scholarly apparatus. Beth, as she mentioned, had continued her research in the years since the Florida Press edition and wished to offer the digital Keats as a kind of sequel or companion rather than replacement of the phys uh, physical printed book. Ultimately, this guided a design decision. Since, again, the digital user would likely not just page through the monograph, it made sense uh, to privilege not a linear reading experience, but instead to design what I call a triptych interface as the primary engagement. Um, so this coordinates a zoomable version of the image scan, um, the transcription of the text, and the scholarly appar apparatus, including both Beth's notes and Keats's annotations, in three equally sized panes across the screen, or close to equally sized. Um, so again, image, text, and commentary receive equal play, and navigation privileges not the forward line, but the hyperlink to jump uh, to a specific page, uh, to a specific book of the Paradise Lost, to next annotation, to entire text searching. So breaking down the books helps us see how we could recreate uh, and reconstitute the bibliographic circuitry through a website in a way complementary to the existing print record. However, if the website is to con contribute to the scholarly record, it must answer the question of longevity, it needs to leave a record itself. The pitfall of scholarly websites is often their dependency on platforms developed by third parties. That can be enormously helpful, uh, allowing one to build a sophisticated looking website with a minimum of technical encumbrance. On the other hand, uh, it can be enormously damaging when the third party introduces project breaking changes to the code and you're left without the resources to fix it. This happened quite vividly to one colleague who literally wrote the book on the Drupal platform for humanists, then a few years later wrote this blog post. Uh, to avoid a similar fate, we needed to use more base level coding languages for the website. Now, this can feel a bit like reinventing the printing press in order to print a book, but it may just enable book time longevity. We used a coding language called XML, with a bibliographic coding standard called the Text Encoding Initiative Guidelines, which have been developed by uh, literary scholars and similar scholars for over 30 years. And its power is twofold. One, it doesn't look, I think, too much like complicated computer code when you get down to it, but is fairly human readable even for someone new to the technology. And two, it separates form from content by coding the text like a recipe that describes how it functioned in the print book rather than prescribing how it should appear on the screen. That part comes later. Uh, and since the recipe remains independent of the screen appearance, you can easily change the look and functionality of the website later on if you wish to do so. Uh, again, that'd be difficult and tedious if the appearance was hard coded uh, at the very beginning. So this coding practice uh, gave us a new affordance, which I call broadly addressability, in short, it allows us to add identification information to all sorts of bibliographic components from pages to individual lines of poetry uh, to annotations so that these components can all be addressed or referenced computationally. And this helps even internally for the project today because it enables brand new engagements with the text. The scholar could write a script that says, in essence, give me the text of all poetry lines that Keats marked with double underlining in books two to five. Uh, you could do that right now. In future, such addressability could be leveraged for cross project communications. Recall how in our bibliographic components, we had the platonic ideal of the work known as Paradise Lost, kind of like that platonic chair in the sky that shadows behind every actual chair. Uh, the use of identification tags uh, on the various pieces of Keats's Paradise Lost means that in the theoretical future, it could be digitally cross-linked with some or Paradise Lost in the Sky, 
and then compared against any other specific paradise lost similarly cross-linked. So then we might compare Keats's marking practices against other uh, marked paradise losts similarly coded. And um, indeed there are efforts in the field, Folger's Shakespeare Library has done something like this for uh, the first folio. Um, and while it may not be the elegant intertextuality of poetic illusion, it hopefully augments the scholar's creative connection making across the literary archive. Most importantly, even if this broader cross-linking dream smacks more of a pipe dream, the computational addressability of elements in our recipe means that the work can be referenced in scholarship with reasonable assurance that the artifact will be recoverable. Indeed, users can download our recipe today and store it on their own computers, perhaps in the same folder that they're using to write their article draft. Uh, there are other forms of addressability that are enabled. Um, most significantly, it allows easy tracking of changes across time because I think the mutability of the digital stands alongside the precarity of disappearance as dangers uh, that uh, cause one to maybe avoid quoting uh, digital artifacts. Um, with our recipe method, however, one can easily identify and retrieve the exact state of the project as quoted. An example comes from our own volume, uh, conference volume of essays. In my chapter, I quote the Carrots Paradise Lost Project in its 1.0 instantiation, yet the library, uh, web, the website today clearly identifies its current status as 1.01. So you can go back and see what has changed since. Um, and so through this breakdown and reconstitution of the book in digital form, I hope uh, we have at least given a sense in which reuse and rereading are at the heart of the Keats Paradise Lost Enterprise. And with that, I will now turn it over to Greg Kusich to analyze rereading in that realm of the academic conference. Thank you. Great, Dan. Uh, thanks, Nick and Winifred, for staging this uh, fabulous assembly today. Uh, and I'd like to say it's been a delight working with Beth and Dan uh, throughout our various endeavors. Uh, and I really wish to thank them both for uh, soldiering on with the book project uh, while I was recovering from surgery just last year. Uh, Beth has been nothing less than heroic in contributing so much to the collection of essays while taking the key point position in our various uh, complex interactions with our volumes publisher, Paul Gray McMillan. Now, moving onward. As we conducted work on Keats's edition of Paradise Lost, we simultaneously developed plans to host an international conference on Keatsian intertextuality to augment our specific digital version of Keats's interactions with Milton and Paradise Lost. And Dan, do you want to put the uh, conference program up now? Okay, great. Uh, aiming to hold this event in the summer of 2018 as a means of celebrating the bicentenary of Keats's deep engagement with Paradise Lost in 1818, we considered possible venues and settled on two locations in London, Keats House in Hampstead and Notre Dame's Conference and Teaching Center on the edge of Trafalgar Square next to the National Gallery. The two venues uh, offering the delightful Keatsian movable feast for our conference attendees. Keats has proved to be a yet more fitting location for this endeavor when its staff offered to put on display Keats's physical edition of Paradise Lost. During our opening day at Keats House and the next door live. Uh, Greg, you've accidentally muted yourself, I think. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, you're back. Where should I go back to? Just a few lines? Yes. Okay. Um, I mentioned the two venues uh, where the conference was being held uh, and Keats House proved to be a yet more fitting location for our endeavor when its staff offered to put on display Keats's physical edition of Paradise Lost. During our opening day at Keats House, uh, conference attendees were welcomed to explore Keats House and the Paradise Lost edition. 
And we wish to express our deep gratitude to Keats House for opening its marvelous treasures to our company. On the second day, we shifted to Trafalgar Square and the Notre Dame Conference facility, which dates from 1906 and first opened as the United University Club, the London Club for Cambridge and Oxford alumni. We also thank the University of Notre Dame for providing this venue as well as most of the funding for the overall uh, two-day event. In our conference planning, we built on the Digital Paradise Lost project to focus the event more expansively on the unique qualities of Keatsian intertextuality, looking back on the many writers with whom Keats interacted and forward to the plenitude of writers who have creatively engaged with him. Hence the conference title, Keats's Reading, Keats. We put out a call for papers and also invited some prominent scholars who have become leaders on the topic of Keatsian intertextuality, endeavoring to combine senior figures in the field, scholars who are adding their insights to the conference theme. We aim to assemble a mid-sized group, mid group of, of about 35 speakers, complemented by friends of Keats in the general public, so as to avoid concurrent sessions and provide a sustained collective conversation that could unfold um, in rewarding ways throughout the overall event. Numerous paper proposals arrive from both America and Britain on a compelling range of specific themes, enabling us to formulate such panels as Keats's reading of medieval and Renaissance writers, Keats and his contemporaries, theories of adaptation and translation in relation to Keats, the impact of Keats throughout the 19th century, and Keats's persisting legacy in 20th and 21st century poetry, fiction, and art. The recent experience of digitizing Paradise Lost gave rise to a cutting edge panel uh, that Dan was leading on the overall challenges and rewards of digitizing earlier texts and manuscripts. Another special opportunity arose featuring the immediate dynamics of Keatsian interaction when we arranged to bring together several contemporary scholar poets uh, in a concluding panel on living poets read Keats. The keynote speaker was Stanley Plumley, sadly deceased two years ago, addressing the topic of Keats as our contemporary. And Beth, do you want to continue now uh, with uh, the way the conference led into uh, the volume? Okay, yes. So uh, the third phase of our evolving project is a collection of essays derived from the 2018 London Conference. And that volume is due to be published by Paul Grave Macmillan in the very near future. Um, we're currently reviewing the final page proof, so hope it will be out not long after we uh, return those. The topic of the book is the same as that for the conference, an examination of both Keats's reading in response to other writers and later writers reading of Keats and incorporation of his poems and letters in their own work. As I explain in the introduction to our volume, Although all writers imitate, borrow from, and build on other writers, Keats's poetry is notable for the extent to which it engages with other texts. His first extant poem is Imitation of Spencer, and all of his work is dense with echoes of and allusions to other poems and prose works. We just heard another possibility uh, today, uh, Katsabu's The Stranger. The paradox, however, is that by composing verse that is heavily dependent on other people's writings, Keats creates highly original works with a voice and style uniquely his own. Henry Weinfield, who is one of our contributors, articulates this conundrum when he states that Keats's Hyperion is completely dependent on Paradise Lost, and yet at the same time, extraordinarily beautiful, resonant, and hence original in its own right. Indeed, one is tempted to say that the poem achieves originality 
not in spite of, but because of its dependence on Milton's epic. The neurologist Oliver Sacks has recently offered an account of the creative process that may help to explain Keats' method of composition. All of us borrow from others from the culture around us, Sacks writes. The central issue for writers and artists is how deeply one assimilates borrowing, takes it into oneself, compounds it with one's own experiences and thoughts and feelings, places it in relation to oneself, and expresses it in a new way. Keats himself employs similar concepts of absorbing and personalizing sources when he compares the creative process to digestion. In his early sonnet, How Many Bards Gild the Lapses of Time, he refers to his favorite poets as the food of my delighted fancy, who throng into his mind whenever I sit me down to rhyme. In this metaphor, the poet hungrily devours other texts, which are then broken down and incorporated into his body, providing fuel and nutrition to allow him to bring forth his own literary fruits. If Keats drew extensively on other texts for his own poetry, um, I'm sorry, um, if Keats drew extensively on other texts, his own poetry and also his thoughtful engaging letters had been a fecund source of inspiration for later writers. In this manner, our literary works perpetuated as writers read, assimilate, and I'm sorry, something just happened with my text. <laughs> um, uh, um, in this matter, our literary canons and traditions developed and perpetuated as writers read, assimilate, and reproduce elements of previous writers' texts in their own compositions. Keats' reading, reading Keats, explores Keats' dual position in this chain of transmission, carrying forward the work of previous writers, and in turn being kept alive by literary sons and daughters. The subtitle of our book is Essays in Memory of Jack Stillinger. We decided from the start that we would dedicate the volume to Jack as a way of honoring our debt to his invaluable scholarship on Keats. Sadly, Jack passed away on April 4th, 2020, and our collection became a memorial volume. Jack was my dissertation director, and I supplied for our volume an essay surveying the highlights of his career and a selected bibliography of his major publications. Keats's reading, reading Keats explores the influence of creative writers on other writers, but in honoring the exemplary career of Jack Stillinger, it is also a testament to the way important scholars shape and continue to live on in the work of their successors. After the essay on Jack's career, the book is composed of four sections that together address the several components of our project. Um, and Dan, if you could put up the table of contents so people can follow along. Um, print is small, but I think you can basically make it out. Uh, the first section, Theorizing Keats's Reading, contains three essays that explore major patterns in and implications of the, the poet's intertextual dialogues with other works. Susan J. Wolfson's Keats the Reader closely examines Keats's creative borrowings from other poets in five of his sonnets and the second unfinished canto of The Fall of Hyperion. Besides minutely tracking Keats's responses to the words of other poets, the essay analyzes several drawing and paintings of Keats depicted in the act of reading, demonstrating that contemporaries considered this activity central to his identity. John Barnard's uh, Keats's Metaphors of Reading considers what Keats' metaphors describing the act of reading can tell us about his experience of reading poetry on the page. Keats's metaphors, Barnard determines, make clear that for Keats, the essential access to poetry was through the auditory imagination. And poetry for Keats is therefore essentially a spoken art. In the translational poetics of John Keats, Alan Buell challenges the common view that Keats moved away from imitation with the discovery of his own originary voice as he matured as a poet. Instead, Buell argues, Keats continued to see poetry in translational terms, 
and his poems should be viewed as inherently dialogic or dyadic. They find their meaning, that is, they actually find their voice through their relationship to another creative work written in a different time and place. The essay explores these issues in Isabella or the Pot of Basil, a poem Buell believes established establish the framework of much of Keats's later work. And the fourth essay in this section is Dan Johnson's rereading Keats's reading in the digital realm, which describes our digital edition of Keats's Paradise Lost and considers some of the advantages and disadvantages of publishing Keats's marginalia in this medium. And Dan's presentation today will have given you a good sense of some of the major issues that he explores in this chapter. Uh, Greg now is gonna take over discussing the next two sections of our book and I will return for the final part four just to keep things lively, I guess. <laughs> well, we thought we'd mix things up so that you'd be hearing all of our voices uh, in different ways at different times. Um, the next two sections of the volume include nine essays overall, addressing in part two, Keats's multifaceted types of engagement with precursor and contemporary writers. And then in part three, his profound impact on writers who followed him throughout the 19th and 20th centuries up to contemporary avant-garde poets. In treating this wide historical range of Keatsian intersections, our contributors centrally address and advance critical areas of study in recent Keats scholarship, such as Chuck Jepka's analysis of Keats's deep uneasiness manifested in Isabella about attracting a popular, especially female readership. Denise Giganti's study of Keats's epic explorations and struggle to embrace in sublime pathos an existential condition of dark non-meaning. Beth Lau's extension of Stillinger-like scholarship uh, on Keats's divisions between romance and reality experienced in his responses to novels of the 18th and 19th centuries. Mark Sandy's related treatment of similar Keatsian divisions as modulated in the poetry of Wallace Stevens. Paul Chirico's investigation of the keen importance of supportive, often overlapping literary circles for both Keats and Claire. Kelvin Everest's tracking of how Keats became famous in the Victorian period, which is the subject, uh, I believe, of work in progress by Nick Rowe right now. There's also Jeffrey Robinson's approach to the politically liberating effects of Keats's Cockney or Huntian formal poetic experiments as continued and modified by recent avant-garde poets. Through these frequently intersecting critical conversations about Keats's precursors and followers, the contributors to parts two and three of our volume produce a cornucopia of extensions and reformulations of many of the most significant issues in recent and current Keats criticism. To be more specific about individual essays in these sections, part two begins with a study by Chuck Zepka that nicely bridges part one in its theoretical consideration of the tensions, anxieties, and possibilities of literary transmission as particularly experienced in Keats' sustained transmutation of Boccaccio throughout the allegorical work of Isabella or the Pot of Basil. Jepka extends critical readings of the anti-capitalist elements of Isabella by tracing throughout the narrative of Isabella's grotesque labor in exhuming and decapitating Lorenzo's corpse as nourishment for the basil plant, a complex allegory of Keats's own anxieties about the conflicts between poetry as gift exchange or commodity bestowed 
for financial gain upon a popular, mainly female audience of readers. This analysis intersects provocatively with studies by Margaret Homans, Susan Wolfson, and Marjorie Levinson, among others, about Keats's ongoing struggle, sometimes debilitating, but also creatively productive with the issues of his own uh, gendered identity. The topic of Keats's gendered identity continues in Sarah Powery's examination of the Eve of St. Agnes in conversation with Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida. In the aspects of the Eve of St. Agnes that dramatize Porphyro's moments of dreaminess and weakened faintness, Powery tracks Keats's identification through Porfirio, Porfirio with the dimensions of affective masculinity in Chaucer's Troilus. Much as Jack Stillinger has rather exhaustively argued for the split between enchanting romance and more sinister reality in the Eve of St. Agnes, Powery finds much to add to this critical emphasis by showing how Keats embraces a kind of gentle masculinity in what she calls his, quote, affective reading and adaptation of Chaucer's poem. Powery's new way of considering the function of enchantment in the Eve of St. Agnes can be particularly valuable for developing work, some of which I've begun myself, on the kind of gentle, unthreatening male friendships Keats found to be nurturing and creatively stimulating in the hunt circle as specifically celebrated at the end of sleep and poetry. Henry Weinfield next addresses the topic of Keats's attractions to romance and enchantment from a different perspective. In a wide ranging essay providing detailed close analysis and a deep sensitivity to illusion and poetic echoes, Weinfield examines Keats's ongoing engagements with Shakespeare and Thomas Gray, particularly in When I Have Fears and The Ode on Indolence, focusing specifically on the tensions between human mortality and the potential permanence of literary fame or afterlife in Shakespeare's sonnets and Gray's elegy, Weinfield examines Keats's confrontations with the problematics of unfulfilled creative potential and his questioning of the consolations of literary fame. In an argument that complicates Keats's well-known claim that Shakespeare should be enough for us, Weinfield contends that Keats actually rejects Shakespearean consolations of literary fame without self-pity and embraces instead the mutability or nothingness of all human experience. Denise Giganti explores a related Keatsian theme of existential mutability. Actually, a prominent line of investigation throughout this volume in her reading of Keats's intense reactions to the to the profundity of satanic darkness, particularly sunspots emphasized in Joseph Addison's spectator series of essays on Paradise Lost. In a study very nicely connected to the project digitizing Keats's copy of Paradise Lost, Giganti shows how Keats conducts what she calls an epic exploration in Hyperion of Milton's great simile of Satan, a gigantic sunspot in book three of Paradise Lost. For Keats, Giganti explains, that image partakes of the Miltonic sublime as Addison defines it, which Keats finds combined with a tremendous element of pathos in the figures of Hyperion and the fallen Titans. Hyperion's devastating experience of loss and the emptying out of meaning in existence, Giganti argues, constitutes, quote, an existential crisis that Hyperion torturously refuses to accept. Keats, however, comes to embrace this sublime pathos as the defining condition 
of mortal experience that many contributors in this volume find at the core of Keatsian vision and poetics. One of the other central elements of Keats's thought and poetry that we have seen emphasized by a number of contributors, the conflict between imaginative enchantment and realistic human experience, emerges as a primary theme in Beth Lau's essay on Keats as a reader of novels. Concluding this section on Keats's reading, Beth's study also takes us in a new direction, relatively unexplored in Keats' criticism. As Beth shows in a detailed way, Keats extensively read and commented on 18th century novels, along with the most recent novels of his own time. Exploratory in rewarding ways, Beth's essay closes with a very useful appendix on novels Keats read, which includes works by Defoe, Fielding, Richardson, Smollett, Godwin, Radcliffe, Edgeworth, Scott, as well as many others. In this wide ranging survey, Beth also reveals how our awareness of Keats's reading of these works can greatly deepen specific major areas of Keats scholarship. Although Keats critics have often discussed his disparaging remarks on women novelists and readers, for instance, Beth's essay shows how favorably Keats read Edgeworth's fiction and how thoroughly he read Richardson's exfoliation of female consciousness in Clarissa. Beth also demonstrates the important role novel writing of Keats's time played in contemporary debates about the compelling poles of imaginative romance and literary treatments of the variegated realities of human experience. That Keats significantly incorporated novel writing into his own sustained wrestling with this tension emerges in his detailed preference for Smollett's realism over Scott's romance. Arguably, the most poignant example of Keats's location of this conflict in novel writing lies with his request for Seven, Set Severn to read to him on his deathbed, Don Quixote. That essential combination of chivalric enchantment and the inexorable pathos of death in its conclusion. So I have uh, mixed up not my page. Oh, here I am. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, moving toward an end now. The next section of our volume, exploring Keats's impact on other writers, begins with Paul Chirico's essay on Claire's deep sense of closeness to Keats and his extensive engagement with Keats's poetry in his own writing. Although the two never met, Claire spoke of Keats as a, quote, brother and productively identified with Keats's struggle for acceptance in the literary sphere and the important support he received through inclusion in literary circles, such as the one gathered around their shared publisher, John Taylor. Chirico notes how Claire could criticize what he considered to be Keats's lack of immersion in the actual depths of nature and his seeming over-reliance on classical mythology but on the other hand, Chirico also shows in considerable detail how Claire, throughout his poetic development, sought to incorporate from Keats a compelling to stimulate in the minds of readers two antithetical impulses, an intense embedding in a slow moment and a surrender to the dynamic force of active language. This focus on the strong attractions of Keatsian poetic innovations on the level of form and diction continues in Kelvin Everest's essay on Keats among the Victorians. Contrary to what is generally upheld by many Keats critics, his afterlife 
among the poets actually preceded Monckton Milne's influential life letters and literary remains in 1848. Keats maintained a smallish but impressed following for the appearance of this volume, but his readership and influence did considerably expand after the appearance of Mockman Milne's volume. For many of the leading Victorian poets, such as Tennyson, Keats's sensuous diction and gift for fine phrase making provided much of his compelling inspiration. Working on this micro level of detail, Everest concentrates particularly on the great impact of Keats's formal innovations, particularly his experiments of sonnet form in the stanzas of the 1819 Odes. Everest provides sustained close analysis of different drafts and manuscript changes in Keats's composition of the Odes stanzas, showing how the result, results help foster related structural experimentation among Victorian poets, particularly Arnold in The Scholar Gypsy. In his focus on Arnold and Keats, Everest also takes us back to one of the major themes of the volume's preceding section, Keats's ongoing encounters with the mixture of poetic delights and the frailty of human experience. Mark Sandy's essay on Keats and Stevens addresses related themes in what Sandy calls Stevens persisting, quote, inner dialogue with Keats. While Sandy in the vein of Everest stresses the continuing appeal of Keats's soundscapes, he also highlights that Keatsian duality between imagination and reality that informs many of the es essays throughout our volume. Sandy charts, however, Stevens' post-romantic transformations of such a central dynamic in his ultimate swerves to extend in greater dimensions, something like Keats's sublime pathos. How such a transformation ripples in varying ways throughout the 19th and 20th centuries emerges as one of the principal incentives in this volume to future critical conversations. Jeffrey Robinson's closing essay to this section on Keats and recent avant-garde poets raises in highly provocative ways the question of how Keatsian poetics may speak most urgently to our own 21st century moment. Now, as anti-democratic movements sweep across much of our world, Robinson shows how experimental poets like John Hall, Robert Shepard, and Maggie O'Sullivan adapt and extend what Robinson calls a Keatsian, quote, poetics of democracy, emerging in significant ways from Keats's formal innovations with Cockney couplets, ode stanzas, and sonnet structure. This liberatory poetry, as Robinson terms it, has arisen in recent years to encourage new emancipatory communities and social formations. Those efforts, recalling Keats's own imaginings of new liberties in the wake of post-Waterloo reactionary political movements, may just serve as not the least among many reasons displayed in this volume why we continue to read, talk about, imbibe, and transform Keats for our world today. And with that, over to you, Beth, for the last section. Okay. Uh, the final section of the book offers a, new, a unique feature not found in most collections of academic essays. Contemporary Poetic Responses features three co contributors who are both scholars and poets and who speak to the nature of Keats's presence in their work. In 10 original poems written initially for our 2018 conference, Lucy Newland recounts her engagement with Keats's poetry and letters at different periods throughout her life, explores prominent Keatsian concepts and interweaves lines and phrases from favorite Keats poems into her own verse. Maureen McLean's piece blends 
prose commentary with selections of her own poetry to recount her evolving responses to Keats. Included in her discussion are samples of the marginal notes on Keats's poems she wrote in the textbook for her undergraduate course on the Romantic period taught by Helen Bendler. So she uh, uh, provides images and analyzes her own marginalia on Keats as an undergrad. The third entry in this section is a set of poems by Michael O'Neill. Michael participated in the 2018 conference where he gave a brilliant moving presentation that combined remarks on Keats's poetry and reading of his own poems reflective of Keats's influence. As many of you know, Michael died in December 2018 before this volume was prepared. We wanted to include him in the collection, but his conference presentation had been largely extemporaneous and no written record of it seemed to exist. For Michael's contribution, we selected eight poems from the last book he published in his lifetime, Return of the Gift, each of which in various ways, some overtly, some more subtly, convey Keats's legacy. All three of these scholar poets, along with the other writers in the reading Keats section of the book, exemplify the persistence of Keats's poetry as it continues to be absorbed into and carried forward by new literary creations. Um, and I just realized along the way that I forgot to ask Dan to show the slide of the um, cover of our book. There it is. So uh, you can see what the final hardcover product is going to look like. Uh, so that concludes our presentation and we would be happy to take any questions people have. That's a terrific book cover, um, uh, Beth, and, and I want to thank all three of you very warmly for a, a, a wonderful uh, wide-ranging presentation, taking in the Digital Paradise Lost edition, uh, the conference in 2018, uh, and this fascinating forthcoming book, Keats is Reading, Reading Keats, uh, a book um, dedicated to Jack Stillinger's memory, of course, and absolutely rightly, uh, and also containing um, some of Michael O'Neill's poems. As Beth said just now, uh, the conference in the summer of 2018 uh, was, I think, um, the last presentation that Michael O'Neill gave. So it's wonderful to finish um, with him present here uh, with us all as well. Um, I have a question uh, I'd like to ask Daniel, uh, if it's possible to do so. Um, Daniel, can you say a little bit more about um, the basic process of scanning a, a, a rare, a, a valuable and fragile book, such as um, Keats's edition of Paradise Lost? How, how was that done without um, causing damage to those two volumes? That's why we entrust the professionals to do it. Uh, no, I think people sometimes have an image of, you know, taking a book and smashing it down uh, on top of, uh, you know, something like a copier machine. Um, the methods they have nowadays for scanning rare books is um, if you can open it, you've got it set up. So similar to how you might request the volume in a rare books room, the scanners are now basically mounted right. uh, photographic uh, instruments. So if you can open the book and put some uh, <clears throat> book snakes on it, sort of off frame as much as possible uh, in order to avoid damage to the spine, again, much like you would present a book uh, for a rare books exhibit, then you have the basic setup for capturing the thing. And um, that was, I think, again, part of the expense is just the time to carefully yeah. lay that out and scan it. It's not like the Google Books thing where you slice open the spine and quickly rifle through the book as quickly as possible. Okay. Much different operation. Yeah, so things have moved on since uh, my scanner where uh, obviously you open up the book and put it down on the scanner and slam down the lid and break the spine of the book. Um, 
it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating insight into the process of digitizing a major text and, uh, and um, I, I'm sure uh, everybody will agree with me. Uh, are there any more questions from uh, those who are listening? I don't think we've, we've got any questions coming in. Uh, there is still a, a, an opportunity to um, address each of our speakers. I can think of other questions. Beth, can you take us back to uh, the time when you were preparing your book on uh, Keats's marginalia in Paradise Lost and perhaps recall what got you into that um, field of uh, Keatsian interest? Well, I could keep going back further and further to explain how I got to that point. Um, uh, originally, I was going to do a book on uh, Keats's reading of everything. <laughs> um, and um, I began to do research and the notes grew and grew. And then I decided to do a trial essay on Keats's reading of Wordsworth. And it was came out to be 70 pages. And then I decided there's no way I could do Keats's reading of everything. So um, that turned into my first book, which is Keats's reading of the Romantic poets, where I um, explored Keats's reading of uh, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, and Byron. Um, and after that, I continued to be interested in um, exploring other dimensions of Keats's reading and uh, got into especially the marginalia. And then I think I was going to do a, um, a whole book on all Keats's marginalia. These things always start vast and, <laughs> and become more compact. So um, I went to Keats house to look at the Paradise Lost marginalia as my, my first major exploration. And there was just so much material. Um, it seemed so rich. And then Keats's notes to the Paradise Lost had been published before, but all of his markings had never been published at all. And they seemed so important um, to give a sense of Keats's reading experience. In many ways, I think the, the markings are even more important than the notes because they you can kind of follow along uh, line by line and uh, get a sense of his response and the passages he didn't mark are just as significant, I think, uh, noting yeah. what he, he was literally unremarkable to him that he didn't bother to um, score. Uh, so then it turned out I had enough material for a whole book on Keats's Paradise Lost. Um, there's a question that's coming in here from Gail Stanley, I, I think. Do you think Keats read more than most, uh, or just that we know more about his library from Charles Brown's list of his books, I suppose, and from his letters? Um, well, it'd be hard to say that Keats read more than Shelley or somebody like that, but um, I think you can make a case, as I was uh, trying to do in some of my remarks that he seemed to have a specially intimate relationship with the works he read um, that really fed into his own creative process. Um, and even like Alan Buell's argument that Keats um, needed the impetus, the engagement with another text in order to uh, come up with his own original voice. And there are those interesting paradoxes that it's derivative um, and also completely original. Um, I think it's, well, we don't know if Keats had lived longer, if he might've um, moved a little further from this close connection to his reading, um, but certainly for the, um, the career that we have, I think, uh, that you can say that his reading was perhaps more um, personal for him or more deeply intimate for him um, 
more closely involved in his creative process than for a lot of other writers. Yeah, and you know, I would just add to that, Beth, um, that his reading, uh, various readings seem to be so um, deeply connected with his own thinking about uh, uh, his own condition, his illness eventually, uh, and the condition of human nature uh, in general. So there he is on his deathbed wanting to hear Cervantes. Uh, and we know that he was um, uh, an, an avid reader from the days of uh, Clark's Enfield School. Um, and it may not be that he read more, you know, as Beth was saying, than other, other people like Shelley, but uh, the type of reading, the best way I can think of it uh, is to use Keats's own metaphor. It was like digestive, you know, feasting. He talks about feasting on old Homer uh, and uh, uh, in such a, a rich way, uh, a rich and unique way that gives rise to his own voice, as Beth was saying. Yeah, I wanted to just add too, um, um, in my chapter on um, Keats and novels, uh, I noted um, a number of novels that he read in Italy on his deathbed. And he read um, all six volumes of uh, Clarissa uh, after he got out of quarantine in Naples and the hotel in Naples, and then um, asked Severn for. Um, Don Quixote, but also um, novels by Edgeworth, um, Walter Scott's Monastery. So it, it gives me some sense of pleasure, I think, that um, Keats felt this consolation, um, as I think a lot of us do, um, reading novels when he was ill, being able to um, lose his own identity and disappear into the the um, consciousness and the experiences of uh, novels, characters and novels. Susan, have you got your question? Well, well, Beth pretty much answered it, but uh, they were all readers. I mean, this was before modern media. Um, Kohler's, you know, titles is autobiography, biographia literaria. But I think Beth is right that Keats has a particularly intimate relationship with identifying himself as a reader and tropes on that throughout his poetry and throughout his letters. And it is touching that, you know, when he was physically weak and had to walk a mile to Hampstead Heath away from the hunts, he packed his books. He wasn't going to leave those behind. He took Shakespeare on board the Mariah Cowther mm -hmm. with him and read Shakespeare. And then Beth's report of all six volumes of Clarissa, I mean, that's an accomplishment I have yet to, to put on my <laughs> ledger. Um, you know, obviously I had more distractions, but still, I mean that, you know, there is a real love of engaging other minds through the printed word that um, seems almost genetically imprinted on Keats, um, that, you know, that he is the sort of alpha reader of this group, but everybody read, I put in the chat, Mary Wollstonecraft said, all great writers are great readers. Yeah, and I, I suppose you could um, make a connection to Keats's orphan status that he seemed to find in, in uh, literature and great writers of the past, uh, a family, a community that he, um, constructed for himself and that, that seemed to uh, give him some community that he was lacking uh, after he lost his family. Hmm. Uh, Miko Halloran has a question. Uh, Miko, Miko, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Oh, well. Her question is, are you planning to do further digital editions of Keats' books? <laughs> Shakespeare's next. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we titled the website Keats's Library. And so our desire is to add more of Keats's annotated books. Um, we're trying not to let our ambition get ahead of our accomplishment, but if we all 
survive and have enough energy, um, we do plan to, to add more of the um, annotated yeah, books. That... And the next one would be the um, Shakespeare folio. We shall see. Yeah, we did not want to overpromise, but we also wanted to signal our emphasis on uh, the books in Keats library rather than necessarily uh, the books uh, that are printed of Keats, which I think um, goes back to Lisa Vargo's question in the chat, whether we were going to do a uh, similar bibliographic of uh, analysis of Keats's books. So, you know, all things are possible, but one step at a time, we'd like to get the, the major works digitized uh, if possible. And um, again, it's a, a slow process because just by comparison, if you look at some of uh, similar digital projects, and I, I bring up the London Stage database, which lists all the performances in the London Stage from mid 17th century, I think just about up to 1800, uh, Winifred's uh, presentation put it in my mind. If you look behind this data, which is a database of originally a print volume, what you get down to is a long team, including, uh, I talk about this in my presentation, a largest advisory board, which I like to think of as, uh, you know, simply going to Home Depot and copying the keys to the project so someone can keep it alive. But um, you run into a problem, I think, as you go into project after project, um, and we can take a look at the Shelley Govan archive and look at the advisory boards. Uh, there are only so many scholars to go around to be on advisory boards. So again, at least on the back of my mind, longevity and keeping uh, projects alive is uh, an uh, issue. So we, we proceed with, with caution, uh, but also optimism as we think through the best ways to not just create the things, but make them enduring so that if you quote it, you can call it up in uh, 30 years time uh, and so on and so forth. That's, that's great. Um, can we take down the, the um, screen? That's, that's fine. Are, th are there any other questions um, from those who are, who are listening? Um, I'll just give it a second to see if anything appears but I think probably we've reached the end of midwinter Keats with that spectacular presentation from Beth and Daniel and Greg um, a phrase that Greg used um, Keats in our world today which I think uh, encapsulates um, all that you uh, you've said uh, in the last hour or, or so about the edition the conference and the forthcoming book and I suppose I could uh, broaden that to include all of the presentations that we've had uh, this afternoon. Um, so the comments that are coming in are on the chat column show how much your presentations have been appreciated by everyone who has attended. Um, I'm not sure if Winifred's been keeping an eye on the numbers, but we were well over 80 um, uh, at one stage, uh, which, which is uh, impressive indeed, as I'm sure you'll agree. Um, I, I'd like to finish by reminding you of the Keats Conference, 20th to the 22nd of May at Keats House in Hampstead, uh, in the Nightingale Room, as it's called. Um, I do hope uh, you'll all be able to join uh, us there. The Keats Foundation May Conference will return on the 20th to the 22nd of May this year. Uh, uh, thank you again to all our speakers and all who attended. Um, I suppose it's time to say goodbye unless you want to continue chatting, um, but um, hopefully we'll all meet, uh, uh, if not in May, sometime this year uh, or sometime soon. Thank you all um, and see you again soon. Thank you, Nick. All right, thank you, Nick thank and Winifred so much. Yes, thank you very Take much. Take great care. Thank you.